Good afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business this afternoon is a statement by Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil on care and sharing. Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement, and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. Cabinet Secretary, ten minutes or thereby, please. Thank you very much indeed, Deputy Presiding Officer. One of the key functions of government is the care it provides, funds, supports, encourages and regulates. Care and caring touches every family in our nation. And today I want to update Parliament on the next steps in developing a longer term strategy for care services and support relating to integration, national care standards, residential care, intermediate care and continuing care. The Public Bodies Joint Working Act received royal assent last month. And I'm pleased to tell Parliament that we will begin consultation on the first substantial set of accompanying regulations on the 12th of May, with the second set beginning before the end of May. These regulations will underpin the operation of health and social care integration across Scotland, including the prescription of the integration scheme, the functions that must be delegated by local authorities, the functions that may or that must be delegated by a health board, and the national health and wellbeing outcomes. I would encourage everyone with an interest to respond to the consultations which will run through to August. It's not enough simply, though, to improve the organisational and operational structure of care services. We must also continue to develop the standards of care that is provided. The national care standards were created in 2002 to help people who benefit from care services understand what to expect from them and for service providers to understand the standards they are expected to achieve. In the 12 years since the standards were introduced, a great deal has changed in how care services are delivered, not least in future from the Public Bodies Act. To keep pace with these changes, we will also begin consulting on new national care standards at the end of May. We not only want to underpin the quality of care, we also want to improve fairness. We want everyone in Scotland to receive a high level of care, no matter what service they use or where they live. A robust inspection regime is key to improving standards, and the care inspectorate are undertaking a wide-ranging review of its inspection methodology during 2014. This review will align closely with the review of the national care standards. It will ensure that inspection focuses on assessing how well services are respecting the rights of people who use services and promoting positive outcomes. The Care Inspectorate and Health Improvement Scotland are also developing a new model for inspection of integrated care for adults, beginning with older people. The new model, which looks at how well health and care systems work together to deliver improved outcomes, will include scrutiny of health board and local authority joint commissioning plans. Working with our partners in COSLA, we've also been examining the future of residential care, our joint task force report on this subject was published earlier this year and provides a useful foundation for developing this vital area of the care sector. The task force considered and made recommendations on a number of aspects of residential care, not least increasing personalisation, planning for the kinds of environment we want to be able to deliver care services in, considering how we commission those services, considering how we align our workforce resources to deliver the services, and, of course, how we pay for them. The report recommends further work on how the living wage could be applied across the care sector. We have already implemented the living wage for all Scottish Government, a national health service, and with our partners in COSLA, local government staff. We are looking for new ways to encourage and facilitate the adoption of the living wage across the entirety of the care sector. The Scottish Government accepts in principle the main recommendations of this report and we will work in close partnership with COSLA, the key partners and other key partners taking forward its recommendations to develop a strategy for the long-term transformation of residential care, supported housing, co-housing and intermediate care. Having worked so constructively with the members of the task force, we will, we will engage with these key stakeholders to also look at personal care services provided to people under 65 who have complex needs to examine if they are receiving effective support. This issue was most effectively highlighted to me by Mrs. Amanda Copel, wife of the late Frank Copel, and I'm committed to examining the currency provision carefully. While there's a clear understanding of the role of acute and primary care, I believe more must be done to develop intermediate care services across Scotland. Intermediate care provides a bridge between hospital and home. 
It helps people move from illness and injury to recovery and independence. These step-up, step-down services provide a period of intensive support and rehabilitation at home or in a community setting, giving the person the opportunity to fully recover, build confidence and independence, and hopefully remain at or return home. Strengthening intermediate care, not least in provision of rehabilitative care for elderly people as they leave hospital, is critically important. This is just one of the ways to improve flow through hospitals, a key issue highlighted in the report published today by Audit Scotland on Accident and Emergencies. This week, I've written to all territorial health boards and local authorities to identify the areas where further support is needed to enhance inter intermediate care services. This work will include informing the ongoing development of the bed planning tool and long-term NHS care provision. Last week, the independent expert review of the operation of NHS continuing care report was published. Before moving to the recommendations of the review, I should set out that we've been clear that if anyone has been incorrectly charged under the current regime, when they should be appropriately reimbursed, uh, and we want to make sure that no one ends up in that position. I understand that currently there are a small number of appeals to health boards that are being processed, and I would encourage boards to bring these to a conclusion as quickly as possible. Turning to the review itself, chaired by the past president of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow, Dr Ian Anderson, which assessed the current guidance and its implementation across the country. I'm grateful for Dr Anderson's work, and I accept the group's recommendations for the future of NHS continuing healthcare in Scotland uh, with two points I wish to make clear in qualification. One is that patients being treated as part of the proposed continuing care programme will only remain in hospital for long as that is clinically necessary. Any patient who does not require care in a hospital setting will be discharged from hospital into the community in line with our 2020 vision for treating people at home in the community in a homely setting. Patient safety and the quality of care will be the overriding concerns. Secondly, any changes to the current policy will only come into effect when new guidance is consulted upon and developed, and we anticipate that this will be in April 2015. That means that the current guidance on continuing care remains in place, and any patient clinically assessed as requiring this form of care must receive it. Any patient who is currently in receipt of NHS continuing care in a care home or who is assessed as requiring continuing care before new guidance is put in place will continue to receive the same level of financial support as they would do today. No patient will suffer financial loss resulting from the implementation of Dr Anderson's recommendations. Through Dr Anderson's group's recommendations, we will work with NHS boards and COSLA to develop new guidance for the operation of NHS continuing care, which puts patient quality and safety to the fore. The development of new guidance will be taken forward in parallel with ongoing developments in intermediate care to inform how services are designed and will specifically address the particular challenges facing rural communities in this regard. Through self-directed support, we're empowering disabled and older people to take control of their own care. Self-directed support is delivering transformational change to the social care sector, and we will continue to support its implementation. As well as the care provided by local authorities, NHS and other public services, there is another vital community or key to the provision of care in this country, namely unpaid carers. These people care for the ones they love, sometimes to the detriment of their own health and well-being. They therefore need our support and commitment. We've invested £113 million since 2007 in vital support for unpaid carers and young carers in Scotland. Our programmes and initiatives cover a range of support, including short breaks, information advice, advocacy training, income maximisation services and education. We are supporting carers and young carers to continue to care for their families, friends and neighbours, and most importantly, to have a life for themselves alongside their caring role. However, we believe there are still inconsistencies as to how that support is provided. 
and to address this and ensure that all carers and young carers in Scotland receive the support they need, we intend to bring forward legislation during this Parliament. Our consultation in this proposal closed last month. We aim to issue a formal response to the views expressed this autumn. Our aim is simple, to enhance the support provided to carers and to address the whole carer journey. This Parliament can be rightly proud of introducing free personal and nursing care for the elderly, and I would like to reiterate this Government's commitment to this vital policy. The introduction of the policy did highlight that when it comes to planning the care we wish to provide as a Parliament, there is a key part which is out with our control, the operation of the welfare system. The people of Scotland are already disadvantaged by a Westminster government that refuses to pay a tenants' allowance to Scots in receipt of free personal care. I believe that Scotland can make its resources work better for the people living here by having a more coordinated approach to the delivery of benefits and related services such as health and social care so that this type of loss doesn't happen. Having control over our welfare system will enable us to work with interested parties to make sure that benefits, the benefit system and the application of free personal and nursing care are properly integrated. I firmly believe that a genuinely person-centred approach that sees care provided in the most appropriate setting, be that in a community, primary, intermediate or acute setting, will ensure that everyone who provides or receives care or caring has provided the respect and service that everyone deserves. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And the Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we will move on to the next item of business. And it would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question could press the request to speak buttons now. I now call on Neil Finlay to ask the first question, please. Thanks, President Officer. Care and care-related issues are amongst the greatest challenges facing the health and social care sector. People continually tell me when asked that the system is in crisis and that that crisis ripples right through the healthcare system. Scottish Labour supports the moves to improve the inspection regime, standards and the rights and support provided for carers. And we call upon the Scottish Government to bring forward a debate in government time so we can debate in depth, depth all of these crucial matters. And it would also allow us to pay appropriate tribute to Amanda Coppell for her fantastic campaign and indeed her humanity and care for others. It's my uh, understanding that the report into continuing care has been sitting on the Cabinet Secretary's desk for months, only to be sneaked out quietly at the start of the bank holiday weekend, so he thought no one would notice. And in his statement, he failed to mention the fundamental point that if adopted, the change in policy will see patients being charged for their primary health care needs, when previously this would have been paid for by the state. The Cabinet Secretary could not quite bring himself to tell the Chamber that this afternoon in his statement. Patients with condi conditions such as motor neuron disease, whose patient association was not even consulted on this matter, told they would have to pay, eh, now have to pay for elements of their ongoing treatment, where previously the state provided costs that can average over £700 a week. Families facing the perverse incentive of trying to make sure their loved ones remain in hospital to avoid crippling personal charges. And all of this within a system that is proposed to have no national guidelines and no independent appeals process. President officer, the recommendations of this report are a fundamental breach of the guiding principle of the NHS. That is an NHS that is free at the point of need. It is a flawed report and having taken advice, I believe the proposals may be illegal. So has the Cabinet Secretary taken his own legal advice, advice on his charging plans? What consultation has there been with patients Should and their come families? To the question, please. And does the Cabinet Secretary accept for those affected by these charges the NHS will no longer be free at the point of need? Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Hey, presiding Officer, can I just concentrate on the issue of continuing care? And let me make it absolutely clear. Neil Finlay says that the recommendation of this report and our policy is to charge for primary health care needs. Yeah. That is absolute bunkum of the first order. Every part of health care in Scotland will remain free and will continue to remain free even when the new guidelines are published. There is absolutely no intention, and I said nothing that could even be interpreted in my statement as saying that primary health care needs are Order. going to be charged for. And people living in nursing home care 
uh, and at home, as well as in hospital, have any health care needs met free of charge in addition to their free nursing and personal care. The idea that we would charge for primary health care needs is totally, totally absurd. It's not recommended in the Anderson report, and it's certainly not the policy of this government. And he says, furthermore, there'll be no national guidelines. I specifically said in the statement, we're going to consult and develop national guidelines. How can he reach the conclusion there are going to be no national guidelines? He also said there'll be no appeal system. Of course will there will be an appeal system, and that will be part of the consideration of the national guidelines. So when questions are asked and interpretations are made, please could opposition spokespeople on that side stick to the facts instead of inventing pure nonsense. Many thanks. Now Colin Jackson Carlo. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for an advance uh, sight of the statement? The report deals with some fairly fundamental issues, uh, and it does so in considerable depth and in considerable analysis, much of the analysis we would share. I do think there has been an ambiguity, though, in public understanding of the recommendations arising in relation to continuing care, and I don't think these are wholly politically mendacious. A considerable number of organisations have contacted Parliament since seeing the announcement having been made and have concluded, as Neil Finlay did, that there is an intention to charge for non-hospitalised care. Now, I hear what the Cabinet Secretary has said, and hopefully there can be a debate where these issues are properly teased out and discussed, but if what he is saying is that, I think it would be very helpful to correct that ambiguity in the public mind and for him also to undertake to work with the other parties because we want the best possible consensus underpinning any regulations or conditions or appeal process that might subsequently follow. The Pre Presiding Officer Jackson Carlow has always makes a very reasonable point in a very reasonable tone and let me reiterate there is no proposal and there wasn't a proposal in the report and certainly not government policy in any way to charge for health care at all. I think where people are getting confused is that people who are currently under the existing regime of complex continuing care uh, when they are in an NHS bed in a care home, in addition to free personal care, they have their accommodation costs paid. And therefore, the misinterpretation, I think, has been around the issue of accommodation costs. Now, I've made two things absolutely clear. Uh, number one, that in the meantime, those costs will be continued to be met both for existing patients and any patients coming into that system pending development of future uh, guidelines and so on. And I am more than happy to sit down with all the parties in this chamber as part of that consultation process and ideally try to reach a consensus on the way forward because I think it's better if we can reach consensus on these matters because it means that in future there will be stability in the system and people have, can have confidence that they can expect what kind of support to get when both financially and in other respects as well. But let me categorically, categorically make it clear that there will be at no stage either before 2015 or after 2015, there will be no system of charging for health care needs in Scotland, no matter whether somebody is being treated in hospital, treated at home or treated in a nursing home situation. Thank you. Right, now Colin Mark MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary may have seen that the number of hours of personal care being provided in Aberdeen City dropped in the last year. And there's been an increase in delayed discharge in the city, with many people unable to access appropriate care packages to allow them to return home. Indeed, he heard some of these concerns when he visited the Daneston Medical Practice in my constituency. Given the Council has sought to externalise its care function to an arm's length company with minimal elected member scrutiny, can the Cabinet Secretary advise what steps he can take to ensure that the Council is reminded of its responsibilities and obligations to our most vulnerable citizens? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, I am aware of these concerns, and of course, I think there are problems created by the creation of an alio, the bon accord, uh, to run these services, particularly at a time 
when the whole thrust of policy agreed by everybody in this parliament is the integration of services, I think to uh, semi-privatise uh, in a way that looks like what Aberdeen City Council are trying to do is about the disintegration of services instead of the integration of services. I am very much aware, particularly of the delayed discharges issue. If you look at Grampian Health Board and analyse the delayed discharges figures, there is basically no fundamental major problem in rural Aberdeenshire. The problem is very much confined to the city of Aberdeen, and much of that is because of the lack of social care provision, whether it's assessment provision or care home provision in the city of Aberdeen. And therefore, I am very keen to work with the council, uh, as is Grampian Health Board, to try to resolve these issues because the people of the city of Aberdeen require it. But I do think at a time when we're integrating services, to hand them out to an alio at this particular time perhaps wasn't the wisest thing to do. Many thanks. Now call on Rhoda Grant to be followed by Graham Day. Right, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary says he's looking for ways to adopt the living wage across the care sector, and this is a key recommendation of the Future of Residential Care Report. If he's serious about improving the quality of care provided to the most vulnerable in our society, he must value those who deliver that care. Can I ask him, therefore, if he'll back Labour's amendment to the Procurement Reform Bill next week to make that aspiration a reality? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, my colleague Nicola Sturgeon is in charge of the Procurement Reform Bill. I used to be, but Nicola Sturgeon is in charge of it now, and I will take her advice on whether to back the Labour amendment uh, once I've seen it. Uh, obviously, we operate as a team, a collective responsibility. Uh, but in terms of the living wage, very clearly, there is no doubt in my mind whatsoever that as part of the drive which COSLA and ourselves are engaged in, in driving up the quality of social care in Scotland, there is no doubt in my mind that the introduction of the living wage across the entire sector would be extremely helpful in driving up that quality. So we're engaged in the exercise with uh, COSLA on how we take forward that proposal as well as the other proposals which are all part of a package to revolutionise the quality of social care in Scotland. Thank you very much. Now I call on Graham Day to be followed by Jim Hume. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary referred in a statement to the case of my constituent, Frank Capel. And can, I, can I thank him for the way in which he engaged personally with Mr and Mrs Capel, including visiting Frank in Kerry Muir a few weeks before he sadly passed away. I very much welcome his commitment to examine the present provision of personal care services for under 65s with complex needs. But I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary is able to offer further detail of how this work will actually be progressed. And can I ask whether he will ensure that at the centre of this consideration we will be looking at the real life experience experience of people like the Capels so that any changes which are ultimately forthcoming match the needs of those requiring the support. Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, Presiding Officer, uh, Amanda Capel has brought to the Parliament's notice as well as to mine the issue of, in her case, a dementia uh, with her husband uh, of someone who is under 65. Now, if you just take dementia, and this could apply to other conditions as well, there are 3,000 dementia sufferers in Scotland who are under 65 years of age. And, of course, they do not currently qualify for free personal care. Uh, and there will be people with other ailments in a similar position. Now, when free personal care was introduced, it was for the elderly population. And the rationale for that was that the welfare system, in particular benefits, such as now the disability living allowance, is supposed to cater and cover the costs associated with disability and therefore any additional costs someone has. And that's why free personal care did not apply to under 65-year-olds when it was introduced by Henry McLeish as First Minister. <coughs> uh, I, uh, the, the issue that uh, Mrs Capel has raised is that there are some people she believes, and she obviously believes that uh, uh, the late Frank Coppola and herself were one of the couples affected by this, that they kind of fall between the stools. They weren't getting the benefits that would have covered any care home or other costs. And of course, he, at the time he took Alzheimer's, he wasn't old enough to qualify for free personal care. So I do believe we have a duty to look at whether that is a major problem, if it's a problem of scale, and if so, how do we address it? And that's again why I've referred to the welfare system in my uh, statement, because clearly the interplay between the welfare and benefit system and the health service in areas like this is absolutely crucial. Many thanks. 
Now, call on Jim Hume to be followed by Eileen McLeod. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. I think the uh, Cabinet Secretary has made it as clear as mud regarding uh, the, the freeness of or not of continuation of care, whether that is for accommodation or not com accommodation. But that aside, is the Cabinet Secretary aware that there's a large dissatisfaction among carers over the discharge from hospitals of those they care for and the lack of consultation that takes place with clinicians? These poor, poor communication leads to poor discharge planning and can ultimately lead to patients being readmitted when the necessary support in the community isn't ready. So what plans does the Scottish Government have to introduce a duty on health boards to fully inform carers of hospital admissions and discharges and will he ensure that this forms a key part of the carers' legislation? Okay, can I first of all say, Presiding Officer, that uh, most of the issues I get written to about in relation to delayed discharges are actually the delay itself in being discharged, because there's very often not an assessment available or a care home facility for the patient to go to. That's why the step-down facilities are so crucially important. I've never actually had any representations about lack of consultation on the actual discharge process itself, but if Jim Hume wants to provide me with the evidence that that's an issue, I will certainly take it up, and I'll take it up not just with the National Health Service, but with the relevant Royal Colleges. Many thanks. I now call on Aileen MacLeod to be followed by Dr Richard Simpson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Could the Cabinet Secretary uh, give an update to the Chamber as to the current state of development of the bed planning tool, which will help to ensure that our hospitals and communities have the necessary capacity with the right type and number of beds in the right specialities and in the right place for the local populations and when it will be in full operation? Cabinet Secretary. The presenting officer, yes, the, uh, the aim of the bed planning toolkit is to provide mandatory guidance on the key steps that all NHS boards should follow when planning bed capacity. The Scottish Partnership Forum, the National Strategic Group on Joint Commissioning and the Unscheduled Care Programme Board, we're not short of bodies in the National Health Service, are engaging with the Scottish Government on the development of the toolkit. In developing the toolkit, we are considering current NHS Scotland bed planning practice as well as practice in other countries. We plan to engage widely over the summer with the toolkit being made available to all NHS boards by the end of the year. Thanks, Dr Richard Simpson. Deputy Presiding Officer, can I draw members' attention to my declaration as a director of a small nursing home in England? Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if he really supports recommendations two and seven, because I find them astonishing, and a recipe for future postcode problems. They return us to an era where clinicians decide with no eligibility criteria, and I'm quoting from the report, no scoring system, uh, and that is what's in the report. Uh, the only thing is the doctor and the team deciding that someone requires hospital care. And moreover, in recommendation seven, this is backed by an appeal system in which a single doctor decides on their own. No, nothing about consultation with patient representative groups or anything. It's returning to a previous area I thought we'd come away from. Furthermore, it undervalues his own report on care homes, which stated, uh, the, the early report stated that care homes should cope with tracheostomy care, percutaneous or endoscopic gastronomy, gastrostomy, that's peg feeding, and the delivery of IV fluids and other IV antibiotics. These are usually hospital care. And I, I really am concerned that without criteria, that we are going to have a complete mess. And I think this is, frankly, a very poor report. Presiding officer, I, I would disagree with the last point, but I fully accept there is a need for guidance on all of these issues. Uh, I said generally in principle I welcome the report and the thrust of the recommendations, but there are consequences arising from the recommendations, and very clearly they require further consideration, and I'm more than happy to consult with other parties on how we take those forward, because I want to get this right. And of course, if there is anything where the devil is in the detail, this is a very good example of it. And particularly, I would welcome the expertise of Dr. Simpson, who, of course, has uh, got a long experience of these matters. Uh, and uh, before we develop the guidance, and before we publish the guidance, before we decide on the guidance resulting from these decisions, we're going to consult widely. And that's why we're not implementing anything before April 2015, because I want to be absolutely sure we get it right. And I'm perfectly open to concrete and uh, positive suggestions from Dr. Simpson, even from Mr. Finlay, although I've never heard any, uh, and from other members of the chamber. So I look forward to that consultation. Christine Graham. 
Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Officer. I note the Care Inspectorate is undertaking a review of its own methodology. Can I refer to my concerns about the current assessment methods in the context of this report on St Ronan's Care Home in Inner Leithen, which states, for example, the quality of care and support for the residents is weak. At a meeting on Sunday of nine relatives at the care home, every single one made clear that assessment in no way reflected their experience of the care for their elderly relatives. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if he feels it's sufficient for the care inspectorate to review itself or indeed inspect itself? Cabinet Secretary. Planning officer, without uh, being able to comment on any individual case, I, I do accept as a general principle there is a need for where there is a genuine, very strongly held disagreement on a draft report that there is some, sometimes on certain occasions and with certain criteria the need for a degree of arbitration, uh, particularly where there is a challenge to the factual accuracy uh, of a report uh, being a draft form prepared by the Care Inspectorate. I'm already discussing these matters with the board, including the chair and chief executive of the Care Inspectorate, and we have a meeting coming up fairly soon to discuss this issue with residential care home owners and the care inspector to see if we can reach an accommodation that's appropriate while ensuring that the integrity of the inspections of the care inspectorate are in no way compromised. And I'm more than happy to invite Christine Graham's constituent uh, to that meeting. Thanks, Duncan McNeill, to be followed by Roderick Campbell. Um, Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's statement as it reflects much of the work that has exercised the Health and Sport Committee over these past years. Um, I am pleased that we finally will be consulting on a new set of national care standards, although I have to express some disappointment that it has taken so long, given that the Committee recommended such action in 2011. And in this chamber, the, his predecessor, the Cabinet Secretary, at the time said that we would have a consultation beginning in the summer, June 2012. Now, given these disappointing de uh, delays, uh, delays, can we have a firm guarantee from the Cabinet Secretary that this will be a full public consultation, uh, consultation and not a consultation into a consultation? And can he give us assurances that the government will be in a position to announce a new set of national care standards by the end of this parliamentary term? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, first of all, can I uh, say, uh, Presiding Officer, and congratulate Duncan McNeill as convener of the Health and Sport Committee for the tremendous work they have done in this whole area. And can I say, as well as consulting with other parties in the chamber, I will, of course, be very keen to consult with the committee on how we take all of this agenda forward, and I know the committee is very interested in how we take it forward. Can I also give him a very firm undertaking that this will be the review, the, the consultation. It won't be a consultation into a consultation. It will be the consultation that we'll be launching. I think there has been benefit, actually, in this case, in the delay, because we now have the legislation and integration passed. And, of course, one of the challenges of the new integrated framework in the future, well, we're reconciling the needs of clinical guidance with the national care standards, for example. So in taking forward this consultation, one of the things I'm very, very conscious of, since we are providing integrated services, there needs to be an alignment between national care standards and clinical guidelines, and indeed other protocols as well. So I think actually the timing may actually have been quite good, although I will admit it wasn't by design. Many thanks. And I call on Roderick Campbell to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's comments on the adoption of the living wage across the care sector, but can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that in any consideration of intermediate or continuing care that the special problems of rural Scotland will be taken into account? Secretary. A presiding officer, I did specifically mention rural Scotland in my statement because I'm very well aware of the issues facing remote and rural and can I say island communities as well because there are particular challenges in island communities that they are not actually just about remote and rural communities and therefore when we're commissioning care services and this will be part of the 
uh, commissioning plans being draft drafted as we speak and consulted upon by the shadow boards is very important for our rural, remote rural and island communities that those commissioning plans fit well with the needs and aspirations of all of these communities. Obviously, there are particular challenges in these remoter communities and more difficult to access communities. And there, for example, the role of telehealth and telecare is extremely important. And that's why we're working with Scottish Centre for Telehealth and Telecare to develop techniques like more video conferencing and more remote monitoring and management of care. And indeed, we have earmarked 10 million pounds for that very kind of project, which will be of particular benefit to rural, remote, rural and island communities. Thanks so much. And finally, Malcolm Chisholm. Um, the reason that primary care needs uh, was referred to was because that is the wording in the 1978 Act, both in Scotland and in England. And I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary realises that the judgment in England saying that uh, someone with primary care needs in a nursing home should have all their costs met was in relation to the 1978 Act. So has he taken legal advice on this? And since there is a lack of clarity in his statement, will he confirm now that anyone with primary care needs in a nursing home will have all their costs met, including their accommodation costs. Cabinet Secretary. So let me reiterate again, and this is the case today and it will remain the case, that anyone with primary health care needs will have those needs met by the National Health Service, irrespective of whether it's a hospital setting, a, care, a, a, a nursing a residential setting, or at home, or indeed in a hospice or many other areas as well. Uh, and that is our position today, and that will continue to be our position. Healthcare needs in Scotland are free at the point of use, and they will remain free at the point of use. Many thanks. And that concludes questions to the Cabinet Secretary on his statement on care and caring. And we now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 9963, in the name of Dr Alistair Allen, on life sciences. I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And if you are ready, Dr. Allen, I'd invite you to speak to and move the motion, please. 13 minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm proud as Minister for Science to lead this debate on Scotland's life sciences sector. The sector is, as uh, the members will appreciate, extremely important to Scotland. It goes without saying, but I will say it anyway, that as a nation we have contributed very significantly to the health sector from penicillin to beta blockers. Scotland's life sciences community not only provides employment for thousands of highly qualified individuals, but it also contributes billions to the Scottish economy. It's worth reflecting that in 2011, for example, turnover was estimated at around 3.2 billion, with gross value added at around 1.6 billion. But it should be said we want to improve on these numbers, and that is why in 2011, the Scottish life sciences industry developed its strategy, creating wealth, promoting health, which outlines their vision for the sector. Now, a key aim of the strategy is to double the contribution that life sciences make to the Scottish economy by 2020. And achieving this will require a strong and coordinated effort from business, academia, the government and the health sector, and will depend in no small way upon the talents and skills of those working Scotland's life science community. We therefore must build on Scotland's international reputation for excellence in the life sciences by ensuring that our firms and universities have access to the, the best people with the best skills. We want to position Scotland as the destination of choice for talented individuals working and studying in life sciences, a place where they can undertake globally important research, a place where they can work with companies uh, at the leading edge of science developments. And that's why we support life sciences skills through a range of mechanisms and initiatives which cover all ages and all educational levels and operate in our communities, our schools, our colleges and universities, and of course in industry. Last week, Skills Development Scotland launched their detailed skills investment plan for the sector. Created in full collaboration with the industry through the Life Sciences Industry Leadership Group, and the academic sector, the plan has four key aims. 
And those are building graduate work readiness, improving attractiveness to new entrants, attracting and anchoring key skills, building an accessible and responsible skills system. And each of these themes has a, a range of actions attached to it, actions that are designed to deliver the maximum benefit both to individuals' careers and to businesses. An example of all this is the Lab Skills Programme, which Skills Development Scotland, in conjunction with the sector, will start to run next month. The programme is aimed at life sciences graduates and will provide them with hands-on support that will help them to secure a job within the life sciences community. It involves a two-week training course delivered by Edinburgh Napier University at the state-of-the-art laboratories at BioCity Scotland, and it will focus on developing the strong technical laboratory skills and, it should be said, also commercial awareness skills uh, that life science companies need to compete in the highly competitive national and global marketplace. Now, of course, it's very important, uh, at the same time as talking about graduates, um, to talk about the importance of uh, starting science education more broadly as early as possible. And so support for biology and wider sciences through the curriculum is perhaps the single most important element in encouraging young people uh, to see a promising career in life sciences for themselves. But we recognise that a number of factors can influence career choice, and that's why, as well as supporting teacher training uh, and CPD, uh, as well as school facilities and equipment, we also fund a, a range of other initiatives that bring science to life for young people, including science clubs, workshops and shows. Our support for science centres and science festivals across Scotland, worth a total of 2.8 million last year, makes all kinds of science accessible to more than 800,000 people of all ages. Now, the science centres work closely with teachers with Education Scotland and Skills Development Scotland to ensure their work fits with Curriculum for Excellence. And one example is Glasgow Science Centre's Body Works exhibition. This has been seen by more than 300,000 people since opening a year ago, and it gives all ages a chance to find out more about health, exercise and the human body. Scientists are on hand every weekend to explain the research and bring the science to life. And a touring version of the exhibition will support the Queen's Baton Relay this summer, visiting schools and communities uh, and across Scotland. I'm sure it will contribute to a lasting Commonwealth Games legacy of a healthier and more active Scotland. In all of this, industry plays a key role too in explaining the science uh, and offering possible career paths. Scotland's world-leading life science sector it depends on a continuing flow of new recruits at all levels. Industry is engaging with young people in innovative ways. For several years, LifeScan in Inverness has been involved in the Bridge to Employment programme, and the company has developed a long-term relationship with several local secondary schools. A new group of around 60 S4 pupils will join the programme in June, undertaking a range of science-related activities that will support science learning eh, as well as skills development. And they will have the opportunity to be mentored and to learn business skills, helping their eventual transition from school to further or high, higher education into work. It, what it is, as I've mentioned, important to get the basics right. Curriculum for Excellence aims to raise standards, to improve knowledge and to develop skills by providing uh, more coherent and flexible learning opportunities from the age of 3 to 18. And it is vital that all our young people are supported in their learning in these critical STEM areas. It is encouraging then that uh, a recent Education Scotland Science Impact report notes that learning and teaching in the sciences in schools is strong, effective and improving. And we must build on these successes. This is why there is extensive support for science teaching and learning available from Education Scotland. And we're also investing £900,000 in this financial year to support a national programme of teacher and technician professional learning delivered by the Scottish Schools Education Research Centre in Resyth. Presiding Officer, Scotland has one of the strongest university research bases in the world. 
producing 1.2% of all new knowledge and with 15% of research classed as world leading. In 2012-13, Scottish universities attracted almost a billion pounds in research funding from a range of funding sources, including government, businesses, charities and the European Union, reflecting the excellence and global reputation of our universities and the quality of their research. And in 2012, the Mobius Life Sciences Startup Report listed Scotland as the leading location for life science startup companies. This government recognises the value of research to Scotland's society and economy, and we have demonstrated our commitment, increasing spend on research and knowledge exchange activities by some 38% since 2007, which represents, it should be said, an extra £100 million. Now, as a result, our higher education expenditure uh, is on research and development is the fourth highest amongst the OECD countries. We have supported novel ideas such as the internationalisation of research pools and, more recently, development of a, a network of innovation centres, of which life sciences have featured, it should be said, heavily. We have already launched centres focusing on stratified medicine, on digital health and industrial biotechnology. Other centres which deal with technologies such as sensors also have a cross-disciplinary connection with life sciences. And what's important to say is that these innovation centres will be demand-led. Research, of course, knows no boundaries, either in terms of discipline or in terms of geography. Its success and future funding is predicated on excellence. And Scottish research has plenty excellence. We can already point to considerable successes in working across European boundaries. The European uh, lead, uh, lead Factory for Integrated Medicine and other uh, international centres, uh, including the Fraunhofer Centre for Applied Photonics and the first Max Planck International Partnership in the UK, which I was happy to be involved in the launch of recently, supporting collaboration across Scotland's research pools. Independence enables us to take decisions in Scotland's best interests, uh, and that applies in research just uh, as elsewhere. I will indeed. Neil Bibby. Um, if independence is uh, so good, why are you proposing to try to keep the same UK system we've got at the moment? Surely the best way to keep that system is to remain part of the United Kingdom? Well, the, the, member, the member will be well aware that uh, research partnerships uh, operate across international boundaries, and he'll also be well aware uh, that uh, one of the Research Council UK uh, leading members, in fact, only very recently, Professor Paul Boyle, Chief Executive of the Economic and Social Research Council, uh, indicated uh, and indeed said uh, to MSPs that he would strongly support Scotland retaining its position in a single research ecosystem in the uh, uh, very uh, circumstances that the member has described. I've just given way, if, uh, give me a, a moment, uh, I'll, I'll come back to you. And I think uh, that uh, the dual funding system, as I say, uh, is successful. Last week, uh, evidence of this collaboration uh, was, was very clear uh, with further investment uh, in Dundee. And it's this kind of collaboration, uh, both at home uh, and abroad, that typifies Scotland's ability to be a, a leading player uh, in the international research arena. And collaboration across Scotland with the rest of the UK, within Europe and across the wider world uh, is something we are determined to continue. And I give way. Thank you, Minister. Scanlon. I do appreciate that. Can I just say that I think of, I can speak for all of us in the Chamber that the success that you've outlined for the life sciences industry has been phenomenal. Will you also acknowledge that that has been achieved with Scotland as part of a United Kingdom? Well, I, I am uh, prepared to acknowledge that at present Scotland is part of the United Kingdom. I am not intending to. I am not. I am not proposing to, to rewrite history. It's a bit. I mean, it, is, it is a wee bit like one of those arguments that run. Uh, uh, will the member acknowledge that trains rarely ran in time before the Act of Union? Uh, it's. Uh, I am not really sure where that development. Where, where, well, it, indeed, that was my point. I am not. I am not. Uh, I am I'm not. Uh, you, you anticipated me there. Uh, I'm not really, uh, not really sure where that argument, where that argument runs, uh, but what I can say is that the member will be aware uh, that over 100 academics, senior academics uh, in Scotland uh, wrote a letter to the Herald uh, this very week, uh, pointing out that they were more than 
happy to see an independent Scotland and more than happy to see that independent Scotland uh, operate uh, its research function across uh, boundaries uh, and indeed continue the cooperation that we have internationally. In terms of the, the, the key drivers that we have, uh, one of the key tools is to drive the engagement uh, uh, in the Scottish Health Informa Informatics Programme, uh, which is creating uh, powerful new tools for linking uh, patient data. I've just taken two, I'll, I'll come back to you in a moment, uh, uh, for linking patient data for research. And also the Far Institute, which will Minister, be you're in your last uh, minute, based please. in part of the biotechnology uh, quarter in Edinburgh. I could go on, presiding officer, listing the many, uh, the many successes that there have been uh, in this sector. But I just want to conclude by saying Scotland has every reason to celebrate uh, our life sciences sector and every reason to plan actively for its future growth. Many thanks. And I now call on Neil Baby to speak to and move Amendment 9963.2. Up to nine minutes, please, as we are very tight for time today, please. Thank, Thank you, President Officer. Labour welcomes the opportunity this afternoon to highlight not only the importance of the life sciences sector in Scotland, but the importance of research funding and of developing our existing uh, expertise too. Scotland does have an outstanding reputation when it comes to life sciences. Our universities are amongst the best in the world, and we are, uh, and our colleagues across the UK have a long, proud history of research, innovation and discovery. On this side of the chamber, we have done our bit to help the good work of our scientists. It was a Labour that introduced a science strategy for Scotland in 2001, which recognised the need to ensure an adequate supply of students from the education system with science qualifications and training to meet the needs of an increasingly knowledge-based economy. It is fair to say that much of what this current Scottish Government have done since 2007 has been a continuation of this approach. The Government's motion today highlights the publication of the Skills Investment Plan for Scotland's life sciences sector by Skills Development Scotland. I welcome this publication and, as the Minister outlined, the plan's aim is to, for Scotland's life sciences sector to double its um, economic c contribution by 2020. This is particularly welcome uh, because the previous Government strategy document uh, required an up updated uh, action plan. This, is, of course, is an extremely ambitious target and one we support, but the real challenge is how we turn that aim into reality. Meeting the skills needs of the sector is vital, and there are a number of things we can do, and the Minister uh, mentioned a number of them. We can look at good practice, for example, in areas like uh, Renfrewshire, where the science and technology sector are there, and Renfrewshire Council are working in partnership to raise awareness of the sector and provide work experience for local uh, students. We should look to build on the sterling work by, done by further education and higher e education. Again, in my own region, West College Scotland and the University of West of Scotland are educating skilled technical staff and graduates who will find work and bring forward innovation in the sector. But fundamentally, we need the Scottish Government to be providing an education system that meets the needs of the Scottish economy. And the statistics last week on numeracy should be a major wake-up call for the Scottish Government. Standards in numeracy falling amongst primary school pupils and no improvement in numeracy standards in secondary. How can we properly meet the needs of the science sector when numeracy standards are falling under this government? I'm happy to take an intervention. Robertson. Uh, I, I thank the member for taking the intervention. The member acknowledged that the curriculum for excellence actually looks at the talents of each individual pupil, and that is the vehicle and the pathway to excel our, our students of the future. Baby. I think the way our uh, students will excel is if we have an education system that is meeting the needs of pupils in the country as a whole. And I don't think uh, an education system where numeracy standards are failing is that education system. And this is a major area of concern, and it needs urgent action from the Scottish Government. And I hope the Minister uh, will respond on the issue of numeracy uh, later on in the debate. But, President Officer, this afternoon it is also important to discuss and recognise the important contribution UK Research Council funding makes to our universities, the role that helps maintain our reputation as a leader in the life sciences field. Because in addition to having a skilled workforce, key to our scientific standing in the world is the research funding our universities receive. For the record, I am glad to see that the Scottish Government acknowledged the contribution that UK research funding makes to Scottish universities. I am pleased to see the SNP Government state in its recent paper the clear benefits to Scotland and the rest of the UK from maintaining shared research councils. And no wonder the facts speak for themselves. In 2012-2013, Scottish higher education institutions secured £257 million, that's a quarter of a billion pounds, of UK Research Council grants. 
This represents 13.1 per cent of the UK total, significantly more than our 8 per cent of UK gross domestic product or 8.4 per cent of the UK population. I'm happy to give way if one of the uh, SNP members wants to tell me, if, again, if independence is so good, why are you not uh, preparing to set up an entirely independent research council? Well, the, 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 first, uh, the first question that I was going to ask is, did the member will, I, I am sure, acknowledge that the, the spending that the UK government makes, whether it's through the research councils at the UK level or, or elsewhere, uh, isn't an act of charity. It does come from taxation. And that where Scotland does better uh, than its population uh, share, as the member mentioned, uh, does the member not also acknowledge that that is because of Scottish excellence in research projects, and that the research projects are awarded on the basis of excellence, not on a political Thank or you very charitable much. basis? Neil Scottish universities are excellent, so are UK universities, uh, Minister. Harvard and Yale are excellent universities, but they aren't in the United Kingdom. Uh, there's great universities, excellent universities in Europe and throughout Asia. They aren't in the United Kingdom either. How much money does the UK Research Council give to those universities? If you want to maintain UK Research Council funding, we should stay in the United Kingdom. But of course, the SNP, by their obsession with independence, are putting university research funding at severe risk. As Professor Paul Boyle from Research Councils UK has said, we give all our funding to institutions that have been accredited to receive RCUK funding, which means they are UK-based institutions. And it's not only research councils that provide UK government funding for research. For example, UK government departments such as the Ministry of Defence and Department of Health have significant R&D programmes. In addition to public funding, the UK's network of charitable organisations uh, funds significant amounts of research. These organisations invest approximately £1.1 billion per annum, 13% of which was spent on research in Scotland. In 2012-13, Cancer Research UK spent £34 million in Scotland, including at the University of Stirling, which is home to Cancer Research UK's Centre for Tobacco Control Research. Shamila Nebjani, Chief Executive of the Association of Medical Research Charities, has expressed her worry. She has said it may be that going forward, people would then think twice about setting up an institute in what became an independent country. And if that's not alarming enough, the Wellcome Trust, a leading charitable organisation which has invested over £600 million in Scottish health research over the last decade on the implications of independence, has said a future commitment and the eligibility of Scottish institutions for trust support would need to be reviewed. There is no guarantee that our funding would be maintained at current levels. That's the Wellcome Trust, the UK organisation, which has a requirement for match funding on institutions in Ireland, but no such requirement on institutions in the United Kingdom. Presiding officer, in Scotland and throughout the UK, we have a brilliant system of research. If independence was so good, the SNP would be proposing an entirely independent system. They are not. There are no guarantees if we left the UK that we would keep the UK research funding, and there are no precedents. It is naive in the extreme to vote to leave the UK when you want to keep the benefits of being part of the UK. If we want to keep the benefits of being part of the UK, it is therefore obviously common sense to be in the UK. Presiding officer, essential to building the life sciences sector in Scotland and throughout the UK is developing the excellence and expertise we already have, not only in our universities, but in our companies as well. One such company, of course, is AstraZeneca, who have their global headquarters here in the UK and are currently the subject of £63 billion takeover by American company Pfizer, subject of our amendment today. And I noticed the Minister didn't uh, even reference that in his 10-minute speech. Members will be aware that the Labour Party is calling for a thorough assessment and for public interest tests to be applied to this type of takeover. Not only because the proposed takeover is worth an estimated £63 billion, because we cannot underestimate how important AstraZeneca's research and development is to the UK. As well as being home to its global headquarters, the UK is also home to AstraZeneca's global research and development facility. And they invest over £1 billion in research and development within UK operations. They contribute around £3.8 billion gross value added annually to the UK economy and make up around 2.3% of total UK exports of goods, a total of almost £7 billion. At both a local and national level, they work close, closely please. with the NHS, including the NHS Grampian. They made a recent grant of £20,000 uh, to the University 
of the west of Scotland. We believe there should be a public interest test on such takeovers. Many other Western economies have such tests, and the UK should too. I hope other parties across the Chamber will support Labour's call. It's all very well for us to talk about how important life sciences are, but we cannot ignore the potential impact that such a major takeover will have. And I move the Labour amendment in my name. Many thanks. And I now call on Liz Smith to speak to and move Amendment 9963.1. Ms Smith, up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I doubt that there are many more important issues uh, to discuss in terms of uh, skills investment uh, than the life sciences. There are significant issues within this area. The impact uh, on the economy has been mentioned, the clear need to better align uh, public and private sector investment, uh, the future uh, of research funding, and, of course, the enormous difference that life science uh, can make to people's uh, health. And quite rightly, much of the plan focuses on the crucial need to put in place a quality resource uh, base which is fully funded and attractive to new investment. It needs to be innovative, intellectually coherent, but also thoroughly practical when it comes to the delivery of science. Let me turn first to the uh, issues of uh, higher education funding, most especially because uh, life sciences uh, contributes 55%. Uh, now, there is a great deal of uh, debate about this subject uh, in the context of the referendum, uh, the reporting of which, I have to say, has not always been particularly well informed. For me, the central issue is not just about the scale of the financial funding which will be available in the future, but about its qualitative edge on how best to secure the extraordinary level of the technical and financial economies of scale which have been such a key feature of the Scottish success that the Minister alluded to. Would that be better maintained in an independent Scotland or as part of the UK? And there have been interesting uh, views expressed on both sides, as we saw on Newsnight on uh, Tuesday. But to decide who's right, there needs to be a very careful study of what factors have already led to that success in Scotland and what factors are likely to be the mainstay of future development. And let me start with the comment about the global position, because success in this field needs to be on the international scale. The te technology behind life sciences is changing fast all the time, so too is the relevant knowledge exchange and the interdependence of public and private investment across the world. Now, the White Paper is very clear on page 452 that the Scottish Government believes that there are substantial current benefits, something that Neil Bibby uh, mentioned for the academic business communities and charities in Scotland. But even more interesting, when it says that it is clear that they benefit from, and I quote, maintaining long-term stability in research funding and systems that support initiatives of scale. Now, two words are important there, stability and scale. Now, I have no doubt that research funding would not dry up in an independent Scotland. I think it's ludicrous to suggest that it would. But there is also no doubt whether or not you support the UK's current model of research council funding or the subscription model, which I understand is being promoted by the SNP, if there was independence, there would be a change to the funding formula. That's clear in the white paper. And therefore, that draws into the question, by its very nature, the issue of the stability and how well that significant change would be seen in the global context, particularly as time after time, the big research council, councils are identifying the basis for their strong investment in Scotland is the strength of the current economies of scale, which are promoted by being part of the UK. They're very clear about that. And we lose these economies of scale because of uncertainty, even if it was just a, a short-term uncertainty, then we could lose some of the competitive advantage at a crucial time of international development. The fact that 15% of UK bioscience research funding comes to Scotland is about these UK economies of scale. And that's very clear in the minds of many who work in our medical schools and universities like Aberdeen and Dundee. And it's also why the 20 million of the Stratified uh, Medicine uh, Scotland Innovation Centre that I think the Minister mentioned, uh, that, that could bring something like, I think, 68 million to the Scottish economy. I thank the member for well. giving, giving way. The member mentions economies of scale. Of course, uh, the economy of scale that's often being referred to in this context is the economy of scale being part of a, uh, a common research area, not being part of a common state. Uh, as I understand it, the subscription model that is being uh, proposed by the SNP uh, is on a basis of uh, some kind of uh, per capita or per geographical allocation of this. Uh, you said, I think, in your uh, own comment uh, that 
one of the reasons why Scotland has been so entirely successful is because that we have gained it on merit. And that merit has been absolutely derivative from the UK economies of scale. What I'm saying is about the white paper. That draws into question whether the certainty of that would still remain in independent Scotland. That's the concern. I, I know you, uh, the Minister, referred to uh, comments that we had from some ac in the academic community, but the majority opinion in the, ma in the academic community is quite the opposite. And I think we have to recognise that. Mm -hmm. Secondly, could I say something a, a little bit about the STEM subjects uh, and also about the uh, Scottish uh, baccalaureate? Because if, if we re really were driving home on this, then I think we would have to be a little concerned about the uptake in the Scottish uh, baccalaureate. And I don't just mean for science subjects right around the board, because I think it's failing to capture the imagination of anyone in education, because the uptake, as I understand it just now, is only 142 pupils right across Scotland who took up the science baccalaureate in 2013, which was actually a reduction on the one from 2012. So, Minister, I do think we have to address some of these issues when it comes uh, to the attraction of the STEM subjects and also to the attraction of something uh, like the baccalaureate, because that, is, draw to a key, that is a key issue to encourage people into the study of life sciences. So, may I just say, uh, Presiding Officer, in closing, that we are happy to support uh, the Government uh, motion, but I do think we need far more uh, detail on some of the aspects of encouraging people to come in. We're also happy uh, to support the uh, Labour amendment. And can I move the amendment in my own name? Many thanks. Very tight for time, as I said. Now call on Mark MacDonald to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I want, have a lot of things I want to cover in my speech based on uh, local uh, issues in Aberdeen. But I cannot help but point out that... I think it's a very interesting assertion for Liz Smith to make to claim that she knows what the majority opinion in the academic community is. I don't know what the majority opinion in the academic community is. I do know, however, that a letter appeared in the Herald signed by over 100 academics which spoke about the strength of research that would exist within an independent Scotland and also suggested that there are already bilateral agreements that exist, for example, between the UK and the Republic of Ireland. I'm not going to take an intervention on that point. For example, the Universities of Ulster and Belfast benefiting from research funding from Ireland. So it's not just about the UK giveth to other places. It's also about uh, cross-border funding that exists in other ways. And I fail to see uh, any argument from either uh, of the opposition parties that suggests that that would somehow be threatened by an independent Scotland. If the excellence is there, the research funding will follow that excellence. But Aberdeen, uh, presiding officer, has a strong record, uh, a proud history and an exciting future uh, in terms of life sciences. Professor John Mallard and his team at the Aberdeen University developed the first MRI scanner. Uh, the first chair of medicine in the English-speaking world was created in 1497 at the University of Aberdeen. Um, the Nobel Prize for the discovery of insulin went to J.J.R. MacLeod, who was a student of the University of Aberdeen. Uh, and this, the university itself is in, one of the, is in the world's top 200 universities for teaching quality and research. And there are seven institutes in the city of Aberdeen which carry out life science research, including, for example, the renowned Rowett Research Institute uh, and also the James Hutton Institute, previously the Macaulay Land Use Research Institute. And colleagues and I uh, visited a, a company in Aberdeen based at Crabston in my constituency called Nova Biotics, uh, which is an Aberdeen clinically based company uh, and we're a spin-out company. And I saw a press coverage recently around the, the strength of spin-out companies from Scotland's universities and Nova Biotics is one of those such uh, companies. They are studying a, a technology based on peptides, which are uh, small chains of amino acids for those of us like myself who are not scientists. Um, um, and they are also developing uh, a range of drugs uh, and treatments tackling medical issues ranging from fungal nail infection to cystic fibrosis uh, and bloodstream infections as well. So there is a range of work going on at that company and it was very good uh, and very encouraging to visit it and see the work that is going on there uh, and to look at the, the future potential for that company within the city of Aberdeen. The, the Minister uh, highlighted the uh, need to produce uh, greater numbers of, of science students and to encourage greater uh, interest in the sciences. And there's a lot of good work being done on that in the city of Aberdeen. I, on Monday, I'll be uh, going to meet with the University of Aberdeen's Public Engagement with Research Unit, or PERU, 
as they are uh, shortened to, um, who are doing a range of work involving uh, encouraging young people to take more of an active interest in the sciences, whether that is through their work through the STEMnet network, whether it is through the, tech, the TechFest Festival, a uh, science festival in Aberdeen that runs a family weekend each year and also has events for primary schools and secondary schools which can connect pupils to STEM subjects, whether it is through having researcher-led science events for schools and families during the University of Aberdeen May Festival, which is taking place this month, whether it is through the uh, initiative that they run, the CAFE Junior events, where researchers from uh, the university go to schools to discuss particular issues of relevance uh, and, and interest, which then encourages discussion and debate with pupils. These are all things that are being done to try and encourage young people to get more involved and to take more of an interest in science subjects. And also the Minister spoke about science centres. Uh, and one of the interesting things, and Satrosphere in Aberdeen is a fantastic centre, and I thoroughly recommend it to members, particularly if they want a good family day out, um, because the kids can be entertained for hours on end by some of the stuff that is going on at that centre. But the, 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 one of the things that we need to emphasise is that science can also be fun, and science is fun, particularly for children. Uh, some of the experiments that you can do uh, and teach children, which they will take a great interest in. And with that in mind, I wondered whether the Minister has had any discussions with his colleague Aileen Campbell regarding the possibility of looking at how we can link science into the play strategy that, is taking pl that the Scottish Government are promoting at present and have perhaps that link being drawn so that we can encourage children through play to take more of an active interest in science. Um, my daughter's nursery recently had a dress is what you want to be when you grow up day and my daughter chose to go uh, as a doctor uh, so she'd better hope she gets her brains from her mother but it brought home to me the fact that there are issues around attracting not just attracting women to study STEM subjects because I think that the trend in terms of female students is actually quite good but it's at the point at which it comes to careers and the development of careers that there are issues that need to be addressed and there was a Westminster report uh, looking at women in science which highlighted the fact that for example early academic STEM careers uh, are often characterised by short term contracts which uh, often coincide with the period of time that many women are looking at the possibility of starting families. Therefore, it's very difficult for them to get a foothold in a career at that stage. They also highlighted that, for example, taking a, a career break can often have an impact on research grant availability later on in the career. And that is something that seems to disproportionately As affect draw to a close, uh, women in STEM subjects compared to men. Uh, so these are issues that do need to be challenged. And I'd be interested to know from the, the minister's perspective what work is being done by the Scottish Government to look at that so that when women graduate with STEM subject degrees, there is uh, of the opportunity for them to have a, a full career in a STEM subject area, should that be the choice that they make. Many thanks. Now, Colin Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Eileen McLeod. Up I'm to sorry, six sir, minutes. I've been interested in the, in the life sciences for quite a few years. I think uh, uh, a year or two ago, I used to go around saying how wonderful the life sciences uh, were in Dundee. I better leave that particular subject to my colleague, Jenny Mara. But more recently, obviously, I've been able to say uh, what a great uh, flagship uh, life, science, uh, life sciences centre. Uh, we have here in Edinburgh. And I suppose I've been interested, firstly, because the intrinsically uh, interesting nature of the subject matter of the line sciences, but also because of how important it is for the Scottish economy. And it's a real success story of the Scottish economy, I think contributing about £3 billion to the Scottish economy with 650 organisations employing more than 33,000 uh, people. Now, the Scottish Life Sciences Association, um, which I think is uh, an organisation comprising many of those uh, um, 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 employers, uh, in its uh, statement of intent for innovation, emphasised the importance of partnership working in the life sciences government, and that means both governments, NHS Scotland, industry and the research uh, community. And the Scottish uh, life sciences strategy in 2011 also had partnership as a, a key theme. For example, in terms of the NHS, that strategy said that the NHS should be centre stage as a key customer for, Scottish, for the Scottish, Scottish life sciences businesses. Uh, and uh, also be a pivotal stimulation of innovative products. And in the strategy that was launched two weeks ago, again, we have quite an emphasis on the NHS and the, the Stratified Medicine Innovation Centre at the Southern General Hospital uh, was certainly featured in that document. I think one other thing, though, that I was slightly concerned by in that skills uh, document was the information it had about the number of students participating in life sciences at FE colleges, because it said that fell 
by more than a quarter between 2070 and 2011-12. And there doesn't seem to be any explanation uh, in that skills document about why that happened. So that clearly is uh, a matter uh, of concern. I suppose there appeared to be some good news in that because it said two-thirds of the FE students in life sciences were women. So uh, that's obviously positive, but we are reminded of the wider issues in terms of gender and STEM subjects and are reminded of the um, Royal Society of Edinburgh report uh, quite recently, which said that yes, uh, there are quite a lot of women trained in STEM subjects, but the majority of them don't work in uh, those areas. So that's clearly an issue that needs to be uh, looked at as well. So in terms of the partners, as the NHS but also there's industry and the research community. And we've heard quite a lot in the debate already about um, uh, research the research Council, UK Research Council and independence. And um, um, uh, Neil Bibby quoted the figure, which is well known, about 13.1% of UK uh, spend when we're 8% of the population. Now, uh, the Minister quoted one leading member of the UK Research Council, but, but the fact of the matter is that the Research Council UT, as an organisation, said it was misleading to suggest that, um, so, um, su su that they would support Independent Scotland remaining part of the UK Research Council. And Liz Smith reminded us that the majority opinion in the academic community in Scotland is that there are serious grounds for concern. So I, clearly this is just one of those matters of doubt and uncertainty that surrounds uh, the whole debate about independence. But surely SNP members can at least admit that the current system is benefiting Scotland. And is, I can never get SNP members to agree one positive feature of being part of the UK, but surely in the debate today they can at least say that as far as research funding goes, it is very positive for, um, for uh, Scotland to remain part of the UK. Now, uh, the other, uh, one of the other partners is industry, and Neil Bibby was quite right to raise the whole issue of Pfizer. Ed Miliband has written to the Prime Minister calling for a change in the law to ensure that a public interest test on such corporate deals um, should be uh, applied. And the issue really is whether the takeover is good for jobs and growth, whether it will protect knowledge, skills and the research base, and whether it will support long-term investment in the UK. Uh, I think it was Neil Bibby or perhaps someone else talked about AstraZeneca's record on R&D. I'm afraid although Pfizer say they're committed to investing in R&D, they gave similar assurances when companies were acquired in the US and Sweden and research facilities were shut down and thousands of high-skilled uh, research jobs lost. So Ed Miliband is quite right to be raising that uh, issue. Now, of course, the final partner in all this, or the partners, is the two governments. I'm reminded what funded the £24 million for the Edinburgh Biocorter in 2009. It was £12 million from Scottish Enterprise and £12 million from the UK Strategic Investment Fund. This was in 2009. And it was very interesting to read the report of the UK Strategic Investment Fund that year because who was there in the preface but Lord Mandelson, the Minister of the time, uh, saying that areas where targeted intervention by government can uh, unlock viable technological development. That's what the fund would support and we have benefited from that UK funding. I've only got one minute left so I need briefly just to mention some of the great work being done in the uh, Edinburgh bio quarter. The first company was Fios, I don't know how to pronounce some of these companies, Genomics, uh, which provides biomarker analysis services through interpreting data produced by gene sequencing. And biomarkers also feature in Mo Inlike, Swedish company detecting antibiotic resistant bacteria, uh, again through the biomarkers. And two other companies are mentioned, eye to eye diagnostics, the commercialization of innovative uh, field analyzers, which is particularly benefiting sight tests on children and frail elderly people. And finally, our biomedical, uh, which uh, deals with research development and commercialization of regenerative medicine. So absolutely fascinating work, but also crucially important work in terms uh, of the development of, uh, of, of services and, and care for people with various health care needs, but also, of course, vitally important for the Scottish economy. Thank you very much. I call Aileen McLeod to be followed by David Stewart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And uh, I welcome the opportunity to speak in this afternoon's debate on an issue of fundamental importance to Scotland's economy and the future direction of our health and social care system. And I very much welcome uh, last week's publication of the Life Sciences Skills Investment Plan. Now, as the Minister has said, Scotland starts from a strong research base, having already established an impressive reputation for excellence in our life sciences. 
And there have been substantial investments uh, in research and development, as others have pointed out, for example, in the network of three innovation centres for stratified medicine, sensors and imaging systems, and digital health that were announced by the First Minister last April. And these are pioneering projects which, by bringing together academia, industry and other key partners, which have been described by our Health Secretary as the Triple Helix, will provide Scotland with a platform for delivering practical solutions to shared health and care challenges on a local, national and global scale. And if you add to that the £100 million investment in the partnership between BioCity Scotland and Dundee University, which places Scotland at the heart of international efforts to discover new drug treatments as part of the European Innovative Medicines Initiative, as well as last week's £8 million investment by the Scottish Funding Council in the new National Phenotypic Screening Centre. And you have to conclude that Scotland is already a major destination for life sciences investment in research and development. Now, as the Minister pointed out earlier, the Skills Investment Plan sets out the useful steps that we need to take to build graduate readiness, improve the attractiveness of the sector to new entrants, attract and anchor key skills, and build an accessible and responsive skills system. So building up our life sciences capabilities will enable us to create and retain a talent pool of researchers and skilled workers who are able to meet the professional aspirations in Scotland because we want to attract highly skilled young people to Scotland, we want them to stay in Scotland and of course to nurture our own homegrown talent. Now the Scottish Life Sciences Strategy from 2011, Creating Wealth, Promoting Health, set out the vision and strategic direction which in turn informed the Skills Investment Plan. And it has a 2020 mission to double the economic contribution made by Scotland's life sciences industry and establish Scotland as a location of choice for life sciences companies. Now, the strategy, as Malcolm Chisholm quite rightly highlighted, also talks about the demographic challenge facing health and social care, as well as the opportunities that demographics present in areas such as assisted living through digital health and mHealth, and personalised medicine, where we can better target treatments to individual patients. And this, in turn, I'd like to make some progress. And this, in turn, links to the NHS 2020 vision for health and care in Scotland and its associated route map. So we know that innovation is key to achieving that vision, and we need the life sciences not only for their substantial contribution to the nation's economy, but also because as a society, we stand to benefit enormously from the research and innovation that will help us care for our ageing population. Now, presenting officer, colleagues will have previously heard me talk about the fantastic opportunity that Scotland has to take its world leading uh, digi health technology to the next level through the international consortium bid that is being led by Edinburgh University to establish a European Institute of Innovation and Technology, Knowledge and Innovation Community in the area of healthy living and active ageing called Life Kick, which if successful will attract significant funding from the new EU Horizon 2020 programme. Now I previously outlined the benefits of the Scottish-led UK Life Kick bid in this chamber, but what I will say is that the kick enables us to pull excellent academic, clinical and industry expertise across Europe in a way that seeks to transform the future delivery of health and social care and improve public health. But what this also emphasises is that all knowledge knows no boundaries and research crosses borders. If Scotland can, as it does, demonstrate excellence in the field of life sciences, the investment will surely follow. And if Scotland is well positioned as we are to undertake research and innovation, which will be of fundamental importance to our European partners who face similar health and social care challenges, let me finish this point, then the resources will still come to Scotland. And of course, there is more that we can do to expand this growth sector of Scotland's economy. And that is very much what the Skills Investment Plan is about. You know, we have huge opportunities, presenting officer, such as the kick bid, to use our unique combination of resources and knowledge to undertake work of international significance. And with the economic levers that we have at our disposal, that only independence will deliver, then we can use the advantages of being a small, agile European country to collaborate across boundaries and borders. And we will continue to promote the Scottish higher education brand on the world stage, giving us a competitive edge in attracting talented academics to Scotland and to increase the ways that research can be translated into sustainable economic growth. In closing, presiding officer, we should be confident that Scotland already has a strong research base on which to build 
for the future and an enviable international reputation in this field, both, I'm confident, presiding officer, will absolutely flourish in an independent Scotland, and I support the motion in Alistair Allen's name. Thank you. Could members note that if they're not immediately called for an intervention, they should resume their seat. If the member wishes to call them, they will then do so. David Stewart to be followed by Linda Fabiani. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Scotland and the UK, as we've already heard, have a proud uh, joint heritage to discovery in life sciences. For example, Sir Alexander uh, Fleming's discovery of penicillin, Crick and Watson's discovery of the double helix, the structure of DNA. And as we heard earlier from Mark MacDonald, Professor John McLeod from Aberdeen, who in 1922 discovered insulin. I'd like to focus on the health implications of life sciences, with particular reference to diabetes, uh, as uh, co-convener of the cross-party group. But this is an important debate today, as this industry is innovative, it's dynamic, and it's growing faster than the economy as a whole. And of course, there are major implications for improvements to the quality of life and step changes to health, agriculture and medicine. And as we've heard already in this debate, presiding officer, this industry is highly integrated within the UK and has had a track record going back over 40 years. And the UK hub of life science has one of the most successful hubs uh, globally. One of the largest life science operations uh, in Scotland, as we heard from the Minister earlier, uh, is LifeScan in Inverness, a Johnston and Johnston company. The original company was set up in 1995 to design and manufacture glucose test strips and to design electronic meters for the global diabetes market. There is over 1,000 highly skilled and talented staff employed in the Inverness facility, which I had the pleasure of visiting just a few short months ago. It's highly regarded as a centre of excellence for those working in the field of diabetes. And with a focus on future development, LifeScan, LifeScan is committed to creating a world without limits for people with diabetes. And LifeScan Scotland's main product range include the popular one-touch brand of blood glucose monitoring systems, which are available globally. The company has also developed diabetes management software, control solutions and lancing devices, and in addition produces the specialist test strips that work as many of the meters in the one-touch brand line. The original company, Poseidon Officer, started with just a handful of employees and is now one of the largest private sector employers in the Highlands and Islands. So in a snapshot, it illustrates the growth potential of the life science industry in Scotland as a whole. It's also important to note that the company fund a senior academic post in UHI in the shape of Professor Ian Megson, a good example of the excellent collaboration between industry and academic community. But life science research does not mean obscure, dusty, little red academic tombs, but real quality of life step changes to patients. Let me give you an example. Uh, last year, life science researcher Dr. Roman Hovorko created a historic diabetes landmark by developing the home use of artificial pancreas. This step offers real hope for a future where people with type 1 diabetes no longer have to monitor blood blood glucose levels and with a better chance of living a long and healthier life. The artificial pancreas is a closed loop system that monitors blood glucose levels and uses this information to adjust the amount of insulin being administered by the insulin pump. This ensures that the person is always getting the right amount. Now, The idea for this system has been talked about for a long time with life science researchers, but they have had to proceed cautiously. Having too much or too little insulin is potentially harmful. So malfunctions with the technology have to be avoided. But in 2007, researchers completed a trial where people with type 1 diabetes used the artificial pancreas in a hospital setting, which cleared the way for a new trial of the prototype device at home. As we've heard earlier, Scotland punches above its weight in terms of research, securing 247 million research council grants, 13.1 per cent of the total, and gained 13 per cent of the 1.1 billion pot from the Nutrient Charities Research Budget. So Lions Science does well out of these funds. And as the Skill Development Scotland report highlights, and I quote presiding officer, the university sector also plays an important role as an employer. Life sciences account for 55% of total Scottish university research funding, attracting 15% of UK academic bioscience research funding, unquote. Within my region of the Highlands and Islands, 
Hand Science Enterprise has recently provided a £3 million funding for the Life Science Unit, which will be part of the new Inverness campus. The whole project could support 6,000 jobs over the next 30 years and generate about £38 million for the regional economy. This type of investment is vital, not only to provide the facilities needed for life science, but to ensure that training and skills development is available to young people to exploit the job opportunities this sector offers in the future. Life science is an exciting industry. There's been breathtaking and groundbreaking work in diabetes and regenerative medicine. And there's been a convergence of digital and healthcare technology. The future, of course, will present huge demands in terms of skill development. There's also, on the wider level, huge barriers to entry. For example, it takes an average of $1 billion and 20 years to develop new drugs. And other Western nations, such as the US and Germany, have developed simpler regulatory processes to approve new drugs. So there's competition on the horizon. But going back to how they are building our future report, makes a clear commitment to growing life sciences in the Highlands and Islands. So the key projects, such as the European Marine Science Park in Agile and the Alexander Graham Bell Centre in Elgin, will make the area more attractive for inward investment. And at Scottish level, the Health Science Scotland partnership between science, academia and business will provide a single point of contact for pharmaceutical and biotechnical companies to develop research programmes. And finally, presiding officer, since I'm out of time, I would say that Scotland is well placed to become part of a global hub of life science, a key contributor to sustained economic growth, as well as providing a step change in the quality of life for patients. Many thanks. And I now call Linda Fabiani to be followed by Roderick Campbell. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm, I'm really pleased to, to speak in this debate. And, and I, like others, welcome the Skills Investment Plan. Um, it seems to be a follow-on from the 2011 Life Sciences Strategy, and it's very, very welcome. Because, indeed, as it says in the Minister's motion, support for innovation in life sciences is critical for the development of Scotland's future economic success. I think we should also remember the other side of that, too. What leads on from that is so important that we develop strategies for the practical applications um, which that innovation brings, makes possible... And that then, as others have mentioned, improves the lives of millions of people uh, across the globe. The Scottish Enterprise Life Science Sourcebook records more than 230 companies employing more than 10,000 people in the west of Scotland. So that's about 36% of Scottish life science companies. And East Kilbride, the, the town that I represent, has a vital role to play in all of this. The town hosts the Scottish Enterprise Technology Park and we have a range of science, small and medium enterprises. We have multinational companies and we have academic organisations. I'm hoping that just mentioning a few of these will entice the Minister to come along to the Science Park and spend the day visiting some of these companies to see some of the practical applications as well as the, the great innovations that go on in East Kilbride. There's the Mentholatum Company Limited, which is a, a supplier of high-quality healthcare products. I bet there's no one sitting in this chamber today that doesn't have a tube of deep heat in their bathroom cabinet. Well, let me tell you, it was made in East Kilbride. <laughs> so there you are. We also have the multi-award-winning uh, ferring, ferring Controlled Therapeutics, with estimated growth of over 10% per year, even in this current economic climate. It's growing in our town in terms of capital investment and, indeed, staff numbers. And I understand that they will be very soon unveiling a new product. So watch out for that. Now, because of the brilliance of the academics um, who work in this field, because of the brilliance of the employees in places like Ferring Controlled Therapeutics, the Mentholatum Company, and many others. It's because these people are recognised as innovative and sector-leading, because they work jointly across borders all over the world in doing this kind of stuff, that's why Scotland generally gets more than its population share of research funding. It's no thank you. It's not because funders are being nice. It's because our universities are world class and because our research is some of the best and most cited in the world. No, thank you. 
And I will go back to East Kilbride to talk about this as well. Because in East Kilbride, we have a facility that I've referenced many times before, the Scottish University's Environmental Research. It's an excellent academic research unit with a varied research output covering physics, earth sciences and biomedical sciences. It is interdisciplinary, it's interinstitutional and it's international in its collaboration. It's been said, in fact, I think I read it on their own website, that Seward covers anything from outer space to the Outer Hebrides. Another reason for the Minister to come along to East Kilbride <laughs> and visit all these wonderful facilities. <laughs> and that then, um, I recognise, I've only got a couple of minutes left, I, I started by, by talking about the action plan. And yes, it's good, and, and I see it all, but as so much, you know, you get investment plans, you break it down, and you look at all the things that are happening within it, or should I say, all, all the ambitions that there are for it. And I sometimes worry that it's back to that practical application that we sometimes fall down on. So I would like the, the Minister to have a thought about it, not necessarily respond to me today, but to have a thought out and respond to me on the idea of reviewing this, of monitoring and seeing how it goes. I notice that there's to be a formal review of the action plan in 18 months. And I hope I can be reassured that that doesn't mean that there is going to be a constant reviewing and a constant monitoring of what, we, you know, what we're doing over that 18 months. I think it's absolutely crucial to take the experiences of all those that are already doing so much to enhance the curriculum of excellence work that the Minister talked about, to enhance the idea of industry getting involved with academia and doing joint research, to enhance the idea of graduates wanting to stay in Scotland and work in the biomedic centre. I notice that um, we're looking at expanding the Oxbridge Biotech Roundtable across Scotland. That's great. I see that we're trying to have more industry and school engagement. That's great too. So can I be assured that we're doing that kind of stuff, that folk like Sue Eck, who are already taking in internships from local school leavers and has links already with fifth and sixth year pupils as summer interns and carries out workshops right across schools in the area, that kind of thing is getting taken on board. We are tapping into the expertise of these people and not just trying to start all over again. The expertise is there. Let's use it and move forward. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Roderick Campbell to be followed by Alison McInnes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The life sciences sector is one of the keystones of Scotland's economy. and It's one of the jewels in Scotland's research crown. It's fair to say that the support given to the sector by successive Scottish governments has helped Scotland emerge as a world leader in life sciences. And the life sciences sector is a central reason that Scotland punches above its weight in the UK-wide competition for research council grants, as we know, and why we have the most citations worldwide per unit of GTP, and why we are second only to Switzerland, another small independent country, in the number of citations per paper published. No thank you. Knowledge knows no boundaries, and research crosses borders. Uh, I don't want to labour this point, but a single UK research area with shared research councils is in the interest of both Scotland and the rest of the UK. And this position, as we know, and as the Minister has already indicated, is supported by Professor Paul Boyle of the Research Councils UK and others. And by its very nature, science is an international and collaborative effort. And it would be absurd to suggest that this, this would stop upon independence. And I see no reason, notwithstanding what uh, opposition members have said, why, to coin a phrase, we cannot have the best of both worlds with independence. The inclusion of the life sciences as a key sector in the Scottish Government's economic strategy is not a surprise. It's a sector with a high growth potential and the capacity to boost economic productivity. This is, of course, why our Government has established life sciences enterprise areas in several locations across the country. The support provided by the government through the incentives available has and will continue to encourage businesses in bringing forward their investment decisions. It provides the necessary support for business startups to become established and to compete internationally. This innovative approach is helping to build upon the momentum generated by the life sciences sector. 
In 2007, the universities of St Andrews, Dundee, Aberdeen, Edinburgh, Glasgow and Strathclyde came together to pool their expertise in the Scottish Universities Life Sciences Alliance, SALSA. The pooling enhances research, training and global credibility and connects the Scottish life sciences community. SALSA has helped our universities in equip equipping themselves so that they face the challenges of global research competition head on. It's absolutely clear that the creation of a large integrated academic research community in the life sciences has immensely benefited Scotland. And by coming together and investing in key research themes of cell biology, systems biology and translational biology, SALSA has ensured that it will build on and advance Scotland's global position in the life sciences field. With a backdrop like this, it's unsurprising that a study by Elsevier, commissioned by Scottish Enterprise, revealed that the life sciences sector is efficiently and effectively converting the world-class peer-reviewed research and patients. In addition, the research excellence within SALSA has helped Scotland secure a central role in the European Commission's Innovative Medicines Initiative programme, which aims to discover new drugs. At the BioCities site in Newhouse, for example, we are seeing the establishment of a state-of-the-art drug screening facility supported by global pharmaceutical companies. This facility will provide researchers from SALSA, from industry and patient organisations across Europe, an unprecedented opportunity to advance medical research and develop new medicines. SALSA has also helped to ensure that Scotland's record on university spin-outs is rather better than the rest of the United Kingdom such that in recent years, Scotland has been the only nation in the UK which has increased the number of life science spin-outs from our universities. And indeed, Mobius Life Sciences have said in their report that this was linked to the increased public sector support for innovation in the life sciences in Scotland. But collaboration doesn't stop at SALSA. The life sciences sector effectively collaborates with colleagues across the NHS, academic, banking, government and industry. And of course, another example of effective collaboration is Generation Scotland. Generation Scotland is a bioresource of human biological samples available for medical research, and it's a unique partnership, unrivaled in Europe, between our medical schools, our NHS, and the people of Scotland. Over 30,000 people across Scotland have helped to create this world-class biomedical resource for research into a wide variety of diseases, including heart disease, diabetes, which David Stewart's already mentioned, and mental health problems. Presiding officer, whatever our pride in life sciences in Scotland, that does not mean that the sector does not have challenges ahead. One key challenge is developing and retaining a talent pool of international calibre in order to support the continued growth of the sector. It's worth noting that Skills Development Scotland, in their report, highlighted that the sector's main test in the future is retaining and training its future talent pool. The report sets out challenging but achievable objectives, such as raising awareness of career opportunities and refreshing research to ensure employ employer demand is met. It sets out an ambitious action plan aimed at improving attractiveness to new entrants and attracting and anchoring key skills. But I believe it's important that we work with the sector to ensure that the action plan's goals are met so that by 2020 we will start to see the fruits of their labour. We need to ensure that Scotland will continue to be a world-leading research hub for the life sciences and to ensure, if possible, that the sector's contribution, economic contribution has doubled by 2020. The Skills Investment Plan will, I hope, help us in, in expanding that talent pool and position Scotland as the top destination for a career in the sector. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, we're incredibly fortunate that Scotland is a world-class centre for life sciences we can and must do more to harness the potential in the sector. We need to enhance the representation and role of women, as Mark MacDonald has already suggested, and we need to continue to work to create an environment that will help the life sciences sector create significant growth in or out of the UK. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I now call Alison McInnes to be followed by Maureen Watt. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to participate in this afternoon's debate to highlight the importance of the life sciences sector to the Scottish economy and the contribution that it is already making to improving health here and abroad. Scotland's track record in life sciences stretches back to when the discipline was first established with King's College in Aberdeen, the world's first medical school. 
Throughout the centuries since, we have enhanced our collective scientific understanding and pioneered many of the greatest advances, from the use of anaesthesia to the remarkable creation of Dolly the Sheep. In my region, Dundee has emerged as an internationally renowned centre of excellence. According to the University of Dundee, life sciences account for 16% of the Tayside economy. The university's own College of Life Sciences alone employs 900 staff from 60 countries. Attracting 100 million in research income each year, it has also helped to cultivate a cluster of local biomedical and biotech businesses. Liberal Democrats in government worked hard to develop the life science industry. Indeed, it was the Liberal Democrat Deputy First Minister, Jim Wallace, who established the Life Sciences Industry Advisory Group. And nearly a decade after its first strategy, focus, collaboration, the right resources and the right people are still central to achieving growth. Skills Development Scotland's report is dedicated to the last of these factors, attaining the right people. Attaining the right people is crucial for a research-intensive industry that re relies upon furthering knowledge, incubating intellectual ingenuity and nurturing technical expertise. And this requires it to attract new entrants, retain talent and ensure that graduates have the skills they need to make the transition into the workplace. Underpinning the interdisciplinary skills that the industry tells us it needs are the STEM subjects. However, I've been long concerned, like others in the Chamber, that the talent of many of the women who pursue those is lost. Approximately two-thirds of those studying life sciences in further, higher and postgraduate education are women. But this uptake is not reflected in the gender balance in the workplace, where just 46% of employees are female. And at board level, fewer than one in five directors of life science companies in Scotland in 2010 were female. The report acknowledges that this is a lower share than any of the other government key sectors, and it reveals that a wealth of female talent is not retained or properly recognised. It's diverted elsewhere or it's overlooked. Reports such as Tapping All Our Talents, published by the Royal Society of Edinburgh a couple of years ago, documented how nearly three quarters of women with STEM qualification do not work in STEM industries, and it concluded that this wasted talent is a serious loss across the whole economy. And that's why more needs to be done to ensure that this talent is retained, valued and recognised in the life science sector. To reduce attrition at all levels of scientific employment, there needs to be a change in workplace policies and practices, indeed whole workplace cultures, to make them fair places to work for everyone. I'm pleased that a major life science company within my own region, GlaxoSmithKline, has signed the WISE CEO Charter. And by signing that charter, the CEO and the senior management commit to actively supporting the aim of increasing the participation at all levels of women in STEM and developing clearly defined strategies and implementing practices to support the recruitment, the retention and the development of female talent. GSK have introduced gender-targeted coaching and sponsorship as part of their commitment to promote inclusion and diversity. And I would urge other companies uh, to follow their lead. The RSE report suggested a number of ways in which government, industry and education establishments could improve the situation. And the Minister for Learning and Science responded by saying, we know there's more we have to do, and I can reassure the RSE that the issue will continue to be a key, key priority for us. Why is it then that the Skills Investment Plan only hints at responding to this problem through a su staff supply mapping exercise? Why is retaining and promoting female talent and ensuring a diverse workforce not identified as a key challenge or priority? Uh, regrettably, the action plan is also silent on the issue. I ask the Minister to undertake to rectify that problem. The amendments tabled today are right to highlight the dividend that life sciences draw down from being part of the UK. The strength of our homegrown talent enables us to punch above our weight. We know that Parkinson's UK have told us that medical research charities currently spend a disproportionate amount of their total funding on research in Scotland. 130 million, or 13% of the UK total, considerably more, as others have said, than our 8% population share. And similarly, NUS Scotland uh, tell us that our universities receive 257 million in grant funding. Again, 13% of the total. The best way to build upon our success is through further collaboration. But the necessity to negotiate cross-border arrangements for research funding in the event of a yes vote puts this at risk. It would be a real challenge to maintain the same level of support for our research base if our relationships with research councils, government departments and businesses elsewhere are eroded. 
Universities are clear they wish to remain part of a pool, yet there is scant detail in the white paper as to how this would be achieved. There are no guarantees and there is no acknowledgement that separation risks our unrestricted access to substantial common research uh, infrastructure. As part of the UK, our universities benefit from being part of a wider, thriving research community. In a sector where collaboration is key, we have the best of both worlds. A strong Scottish Parliament supporting our world-class universities, backed by the strength of UK research resources. Scottish Liberal Democrats want to ensure that we continue to host one of the most extensive and advanced life science communities in Europe. And in this sector, as in so many others, we are indeed better together. Thank you very much. I now call on Maureen Watt to be followed by Jenny Mara. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I think it would be fair to say that having identified life sciences as one of the key sectors of the Scottish economy, where there was and is potential for growth, we have actually seen that occur. While most people, though, associate the North East with the oil and gas industry, Aberdeen also has a very vibrant life sciences sector. Maybe this is helped by the oil and gas industries playing a large part in promoting STEM subjects in schools and showing how um, science is important, not just in the oil and gas industry, uh, but across other sectors. And then teachers who've been involved uh, with the many uh, events that uh, uh, oil and gas companies put on, themselves broadening out the uh, opportunities that there are in other areas of uh, STEM subjects. So this cross-disciplinary uh, approach uh, which the uh, Minister mentioned. Aberdeen is home to one of the life sciences incubation facilities and I've learned today that that is full and I believe the Edinburgh Bioquarter bio is almost full too. And I think the key thing to recognise here is that companies want to be close to both uh, universities and hospitals for the cross-fertilisation of ideas. Yep. Liz Smith. Uh, I'm grateful to the member. Um, I think she is on record in the last few days uh, expanding on some of these ideas of cross-border uh, negotiations and how in, in the north of England it would relate to the uh, north of Scotland. Could the member explain uh, why the subscription issue for university research funding would be better than the current way of funding through the UK Research Council. So I'll, I'll come on to that. In previous debates on life sciences, my Aberdeen colleagues and I have praised the small innovative companies on the Crabston campus, and indeed Mark MacDonald mentioned them again today. There is also the Rowett Institute, which does a huge amount of research into food and drink and diet, not to mention the James Hutton Institute, which carries out research in the environmental field, both here and overseas, including Malawi. One of the most pleasing aspects of the companies on the Cradston campus was the number of women running them. Um, and, as Mark, and they do very valuable work, um, as Mark McDonnell said, and I'll not repeat. But clearly, I think, where women are able to be in charge of their companies and their own work, there can be long-term opportunities and retention of women in STEM positions. And I, that's also a, an issue that we've debated many times in this chamber and that, again, Alison McInnes has just uh, uh, raised. Given the number of opportunities that there are in science and technology throughout Scotland, it is important that youngsters from an early age are made aware and are, ex are excited by the wonders of science. And that's why parents as well as teachers should take every opportunity to visit the science centres such as Satchosphere in Aberdeen, Dynamic Earth and the other centres, as well as science events that run uh, for weeks uh, like TechFest in Aberdeen. But I'd like to point out that not everybody is, like, is going to be a science graduate or a postgraduate or a research scientist. But higher education institutions and companies also require staff at technician level. And I was pleased to read in the Skills Investment Plan that Skills Development Scotland will work with the Life Sciences Advisory Board to increase awareness and uptake of the modern apprenticeship in life sciences um, across the sector. Presiding officer, 
while throughout this debate the opposition members have continued their project fear approach about research funding. But let's be clear, public funding of university research in Scotland and across the UK is currently delivered by a dual support system, comprising a block grant given by the funding council of each country funded from devolved budgets and competitively awarded grants from the UK-wide research council councils funded through the tax base, which, remember, folks, Scotland contributes and Scottish citizens contribute to through their taxes. These grants, as others have said, are awarded on merit, and increasingly they are awarded not to a single institution, but collaborative research across UK and international institutions. With independence, Scotland will have the opportunity to internationally enhance the profile of our institutions and their expertise and encourage investment from pharmaceutical countries and charities alike. Neil Bibby mentioned charities and seemed to imply they will not spend research money in Scotland. Mr Bibby, charities will invest where the best research is, regardless of location. They would be reckless to do otherwise, so stop that uh, scaremongering aspect of the debate. And why don't you also recognise that UK immigration policy is a big threat to research because, there is, um, because of immigration policy, the collaboration that's required uh, cannot take place. In conclusion, presiding officer, I'd like to quote Professor Tim O'Shea, who said, there is no reason why any form of constitutional shape change should preclude participation in higher order research councils or our own Aberdeen professor of Aberdeen University, Sir Ian Diamond, who said, I can't see it is in the interests of anyone in the rest of the UK to want to exclude Scotland, nor is it in the interest of Scotland to be excluded from collaboration. I support the, the motion in the name of the Minister. Thank you. Could members please remember to address the remarks through the presiding officer, Jenny Mara, to be followed by Dennis Robertson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to speak about life sciences because, um, simply because it is very important uh, to the city of Dundee. I'd like to start by addressing a couple of points in the debate, especially one Maureen Watt has just raised. As she accused my, my colleagues and I think some members of the opposition parties of continuing project fear throughout this debate. I think it's rather ironic that she said it because in all of the SNP speeches, they haven't been prepared to take one intervention on the subject of taxes. She said that awards will be made on merit. I would remind her and the SNP quite gently that awards can't be made on merit if you're not contributing to that tax base. People will not award us. Alistair Allen looks um, at me with incredulity as if I'm talking nonsense, but actually it's what the vast majority... Well, if he can intervene on me, I'm happy to answer his point. Yes. Minister? Well, the, the reason... Uh, and forgive me if I looked in, incredulous, but the reason... Uh, I made the, 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 the expression was on my face is because, as numerous members on all sides have acknowledged, uh, a common research area implies a subscription model. It does not imply getting something for free. Jenny Mara. Well, we, we, we'll come on to that in a minute, but I would suggest that if you are not... Um, if you are not paying taxes into the pot that you're then looking to take funding from, it becomes very difficult. And that position is shared by many, many researchers across the length and breadth of Scotland. Can I first of all start to um, talk a little bit about Dundee, presiding officer? Because in recent months, um, scientists in my home city have delivered a candidate drug for malaria. They have set up a centre of excellence for tuberculosis drug discovery with the Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust. They've identified identified new ways to ta tackle Parkinson's disease. They have been recognised for their groundbreaking research in genetic skin diseases and inflammation. And they have been undertaking a wide variety of community engagement in schools, which is very important to engage school children in science. Furthermore, over the next few months, they will open a £26 million laboratory complex, leveraging £7 million of public sector investment that will lead to 180 new externally funded and high value jobs for Scotland's life sciences sector. I'd like to turn to um, a little bit about skills that is in the uh, investment strategy. Because I think it is very concerning that this report says that students participating in life sciences related 
Courses in further education have fallen every year since 0809. Now, given the skills requirements for this important sector, I would like to ask the Minister if he will write to each college principal in Scotland to ask them the specific reasons uh, why there has been a year-on-year -year decline in participation in life sciences courses. I'm surely, sure you will agree with me that this is something that needs to be urgently addressed given uh, the skills requirement that are outlined in this report today, and I wonder if he will undertake to do that in his closing remarks. I am pleased to note in this report that participation of women in life sciences courses is healthy, as is the ratio of male to female employees within the sector. However, we again see in more promoted positions that in 2010, just four years ago, only 18.7 per cent of directors of Scottish life sciences businesses were female. And the report points out that this accounted for a lower share than any of the government key sectors. I know that this was a point that Alison McInnes said that she was concerned about too. And I wonder, um, with Angela Constance's new uh, remit for female employment, perhaps if the Minister will undertake to uh, do a bit of investigation with his colleague on that. If I can turn to... Um, a big uh, theme of this afternoon's debate, which has been funding, and the impact of the uh, referendum on that funding. I was in Dundee University on uh, Tuesday evening, um, actually training in the gym, and was approached by a researcher who I train with, and he was asking me how the referendum campaign was going, and he said, please, please make sure it's a no vote, because our funding, our funding is under threat. Uh, with this prospect, uh, with this... Well, I, I see Mark Macdonald's disagreeing with me. These were not my words. These were the words of a, research, of a researcher who I didn't know who approached me in the university. Now, one of the points that was made this afternoon was that the um, that scientific awards would be made on merit. I've checked with the Wellcome Trust. Now, the Wellcome Trust is one of the biggest funders of the life sciences sector in Dundee. And the latest figures they have for investigators' awards on their website said that they made 37 different uh, awards at UK institutions last year. They made two awards to overseas institutions. And I think the SNP would be very well advised to maybe get in touch with some of these uh, key funders, you know, the Wellcome Trust and all of these funders who are so important for my city and for our local economy in Scotland to see actually what criteria they are using to allocate their funding. Because from the figures from their website, it is clear to me that the preference is for this money to stay in the United Kingdom. I would be very interested to know if the Minister has any evidence otherwise. I understand also that the white, the white paper proposal is for a Scandinavian-style funding pot. And I would gently remind the Minister that the Scandinavian research funding pot is worth less in total than one single research grant that is currently um, undertaken at Dundee University. You Scan must close, please. The Scandinavian research pot is less than £14 million. There is a larger single grant currently being used at Dundee University. I would ask the Minister to think long and hard about these points. Thank you very much. And finally, in the open debate, I call Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, um, <clears throat> I'm grateful to my friends and colleagues Maureen Watt and Mark MacDonald for uh, uh, mentioning Aberdeen and the many uh, areas of life sciences within Aberdeen. And uh, <clears throat> I had to sort of rethink maybe perhaps some one of my or a couple of my opening remarks. However, uh, Aberdeen, Aberdeenshire is a wealth of, of life sciences and we have fantastic universities and as Mark McDonald and Maureen Watt had said we've got the Rowan Institute and we have the James Hutton uh, Institute as well. Um, uh, it reminded me of a debate we had actually um, not so long ago on life sciences a uh, presiding officer when I think Liz Smith mentioned how do we engage younger people into the, the science area? How do we it not just engage but retain their interest. And that actually did remind me uh, of, of the time that uh, my colleagues and myself visited uh, a centre in, in, uh, in Aberdeen uh, organised by Scottish Enterprise. 
And we went to NCIB, and basically they, they were handing out badges, etc. And I love bugs. And I remember Kevin Stewart, uh, uh, my friend and colleague Kevin Stewart, saying uh, when he came to the chamber to talk on that debate of you know, how he loved bugs and life sciences after that particular visit. And I started to think, well, maybe that's how we do engage our younger people. Maybe it's about engaging them at a very young age and getting them to understand the elements of science and fun, as Mark McDonald also said in his opening remarks. Uh, and I was at a school recently in Donetsk, where the, the primary school were looking at uh, bringing forward the, their sort of market garden and taking their produce into the kitchen. And it reminded me of a, a book that the Rao Institute launched as well, presiding officer, called um, Stovey's Reloaded. And, and, and basically, the, the, the book is about um, probably something close to, to, to my waistline uh, in the fact that it, it looks at uh, things like scotch pies and forfer bridies, etc. But it's a healthier option. A much healthier option, using uh, leaner meats and, and maybe not using salt. And instead of using suet, using things like vegetable spread. And I started to think, well, that's the sort of thing, you know, that we need to try and introduce and, and try and, and ensure that our younger children are aware of. So it's not just about what happens at the institute and within the science centre. It's about what actually happens there, taking it uh, both to your home, to your kitchen and into your actual maybe school and school dinners. And it made me think that what the schools were doing um, in, in my own constituency, and I know in Huntley, the Gordon School, they have the Wednesday in the Woods, and that's fantastic because it's all about that learning. And uh, Neil Bibby mentioned about the numeracy. Well, they learn all about the numeracy, and they learn about writing, and they learn about the science when they're out in the woods, and it's all real to them. And it's about how we retain that and then how we try and ensure that that interest at that early years is taken forward. And it also reminded me of one of the schools that was actually through the James Hutton Institute. It was about um, eco-pets. Now, I thought, eco pet I never heard of eco-pets, presiding officer. So it was a wormery. And it was about James Hutton actually looking at how earthworms within the wormery, but it was about what happens to the soil. And the children were actually looking at the soil, investigating the soil and the aspects of the soil, and the elements within the soil, and what was there that would actually help in terms of maybe growing fresh vegetables. So really it's about, we're rich in our wealth within our children, and that is our resource for the future. We've heard a lot this afternoon about future funding and the debates around, you know, um, the, the UK, our funding might dry up if we leave the UK. Presenting officer is nonsense because our richness, our resources is within our young children of the future. And through their merit and through the merit of our universities and institutes within Scotland at the moment, that will be what will bring continued funding into our research within Scotland. Presenting officer, I think it, the, the, we, we do have a difficult task ahead of us, and that is about how we engage our young people and how we retain their interests. But I would say to our schools, and I think the Curriculum for Excellence is a pathway to try and engage that sort of area. And when we take the, the lab and the lorry around our schools as well, that again, that's so exciting for our young people to have a, a hands-on, a hands-on experience of science at its basic level. Because it's, it's about hearing what's going on, it's about seeing what's going on, it's about feeling what's going on. They get the opportunities to do that within a scientific laboratory. Final minute. Thank you, Presiding Officer. So I think, just in conclusion, Presiding Officer, I think we do have a bright future with our life sciences and for our young people. And I commend the motion to Parliament. Thank you. Many thanks. I now turn to the closing speeches and I call on Mary Scanlon. Six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I think this has been a, a good debate on the skills investment plan for life sciences sector and indeed the latest plan following ICT and digital, finance, tourism, food and drink and energy. And whilst I appreciate that life sciences is not all about health, I, I was indeed drawn to a particular quote that I found in the plan, which uh, stated, um, and I think that this sort of sums up the exciting sector that we're talking about today, um, but it was the estimate that only 30 to 70 per cent of patients respond positively to any particular drug, 
I was quite shocked at that figure. And looking forward, research on the right treatment to the right patient at the right time is to be hugely welcomed. And I think that, to me, just summed it all up. I thought, if that's where we're going with this sector, this is just so uh, immensely exciting. But I think we should also remember that life sciences is not all about health, as I think others, uh, uh, David Stewart and others have said. Um, but uh, while the life science sector is well established in many parts of Scotland, uh, I really wanted to mention LifeScan again, which the Minister mentioned, and David Stewart. And I do think LifeScan is a model, uh, not only for employment, the way they link into schools, their work with schools, the work experience, and indeed the, the point that David Stewart made about the linking in the chair uh, at UHI. And I remember when LifeScan came to Inverness, it was called Inverness Medical, it was a, a, a sub uh, part of uh, Johnson & Johnson, and uh, we were promised 300 jobs eventually. Mm -hmm. And it was 40, then it was 60, then it was 80. And there was a lot of scepticism about this. You know, life sciences coming to Inverness, really? Mm -hmm. And now, as David Stewart has said, and the minister acknowledged, for about the last 15 to 17 years, LifeScan has regular employed and still does well over a thousand people. And as David Stewart also said, a major private sector employer. And I also noticed from the plan, many of the life sciences companies employ one person, two people. And I think that we shouldn't just say, it's not worth having because it's small. This is such an exciting sector that uh, we should welcome uh, everyone uh, who comes along with a good idea. I have to say that apart from the schools and the UHI, that LifeScan are also famous for their football sponsorship, and I won't mention the team. Um, but it is important for us to ensure that skills and training are matched with employer demand so that local people have the opportunity to gain sustainable employment and build a career. In the Highlands, we want graduates and others to stay in the Highlands, not just stay in Scotland, but we want the opportunities there. The recent Audit Scotland report on modern apprenticeships stated that performance measures did not focus on long-term outcomes, such as sustainable employment, but also that there were fewer apprenticeships in the Scottish Government's key economic sector. They went on to stress the need to align modern apprenticeships more closely with growth areas. So we've heard today just how important life sciences are to economic growth, jobs and investment in Scotland. Yet last year, out of 25,000 modern apprenticeships, 21 were in life sciences. 21 out of 25,000. Now that to me is not aligning modern apprenticeships with this exciting area for economic growth. I think it's a shocking figure, given that it has been identified by the government as a key sector with high growth potential and capacity to boost productivity. I note in the recommendations uh, that modern apprenticeships should be reviewed, and I trust that the Minister will uh, acknowledge that in his summing up. And while I welcome the 25 increase in undergraduates in higher education since 2007, as Jenny Mara and Malcolm Chisholm said, in further education, the number of students participating in life sciences has fallen by 27% in the same period. In fact, as the, as the plan we are debating today states, student numbers in FE life sciences are now at pre-recession levels. Exactly. Doesn't sound like the big priority growth sector that it really ought to be. I also welcome the fact in the plan and I don't think anyone's mentioned that, but I do think it is an important issue. <coughs> uh, but the identification of the issue to develop soft skills, and I quote, given that employers have commented that new graduates need to build their soft skills, including commercial awareness, teamwork, attitudes to deadlines, work ethic, and communication skills. But these skills are not just essential for life sciences, but in all sectors, and to highlight the benefits from work experience prior to entering the workplace. Alison McKinnon and others have mentioned the fact that out of 56,000 female STEM graduates, 15,000 
continue to work in the sector. I won't go on to repeat uh, any more, but I do think that that is a, a significant issue. And finally, presiding officer, I think we also need to look at the attainment gap. The figure of 2.9% of children, 266 from Scotland's most deprived uh, areas, earning three higher A's compared to 20% of the most affluent is very concerning. This is a sector with high wage, high, high salary, wonderful opportunities, and it should be available to people from all backgrounds, including the most deprived and poorer backgrounds. Thank you very much. And I call on Elaine Murray. Seven minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, as uh, several uh, members have said, both Scotland and the UK uh, science have long had uh, a good reputation. Edinburgh University, for example, has a, had an internationally acclaimed reputation for medicine for many decades. And I don't think the politicians should try to take too much credit for the success of life sciences. Also, I don't think anybody today has tried to do that. Um, governments can make a difference in facilitating the links between academic institutions and business and in encouraging commercialisation, but it's down to the scientists and the researchers actually to produce the work. And both Neil Baby and Roddy Campbell and others, I think, acknowledged that the current success in terms of the policies are of successive uh, Scottish governments. Way back in August 2001, Wendy Alexander, the Minister for Enterprise, la launched Scotland's first ever science strategy, amongst its aims with the promotion of Scotland as an international centre for scientific expertise and the crea creation of pipeline of support to enable the creation of global companies from the scientific output of Scottish laboratories. It also created the Scottish Science Advisory Committee at that time under the umbrella of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And importantly, I feel, used specialist fellowships and the proof of concept funding to link up science policy with investment decisions. So I think that life sciences success uh, is a success of the scientists and researchers, first of all, who are in it. But secondly, it is one of devolution's many successes. Because science, Scottish science does do well under devolution. Many members have referred to the fact that we're awarded 13% of research and development grants, and indeed that publications uh, and citations per capita in Scottish universities and institutes are amongst the highest in the world. 15% of the UK's life sciences companies are based in Scotland. And yes, I agree Scottish institutions get more of their than their population share from the UK research councils because of the quality of their research. Now, uh, Liz Smith has asked us a number of people on the SNP benches about the subscription model, and nobody seemed to be terribly keen to answer her question on that. This is actually project reality. It's not project fear, because it's actually how does the subscri subscription model work? How much is the subscription? If the subscription is your population share, the chances are that the institutions in the rest of the United Kingdom won't be too keen on taxpayers' money being paid out and on top of that to Scottish universities. If it is historic and the Scottish government is charged for what uh, the Scottish universities get, then basically the Scottish government is being financially penalised for the success of Scottish research. And it might as well, as Neil Bibby said, have its own separate research council. Several members were keen to talk about the successes in their particular areas. Malcolm Chisholm spoke about the Edinburgh Bio Quarter, and he pointed out to us that it was set up 50-50 from funds from the Scottish Enterprise and the UK Strategic Investment Fund, a good investment of money, given that there's already 900 hospital beds on the campus, 1,200 researchers, uh, and that's expected to rise to 1,500 beds and 2,000 researchers within the next couple of years. And its specialist facilities have made it a leading European centre for translation translational medical research. Jenny Mara and Alice McInnes uh, spoke about the College of Life Sciences in Dundee, which I know has just received £8 million funding from the Scottish Government towards the development of a phenotypic drug screening laboratory. It too has an international reputation uh, as a productive research institute, and it has the highest number of citations per paper for biological sciences in the whole of Europe. Uh, and, and it has, uh, as Alice McInnes said, it, life sciences now accounts for 16% of the Tayside economy, which is a great achievement. Um, uh, David Stewart and uh, Mary uh, Scanlon have spoken about uh, the important developments in, in the Highlands with the development of set the Centre for Health Science at Raigmore Hospital in Inverness and the adjacent Inverness campus of the University of the Highlands and Islands, uh, which, as they said, is home to Johnson Johnson's LifeScan Scotland, uh, which two years ago uh, announced their decision to locate their global diabetes research centre in, in Inverness. And I know of Dave Stewart's uh, long-standing interest in testing and treatment of diabetes, and I'm sure he must be particularly gratified uh, by the fact that this is actually going on and in, on his uh, doorstep. 
Linda Fabia has, Fabiani spoke about uh, research uh, in East Kilbride, Mark MacDonald, Ma Maureen Watt, Dennis Robertson uh, stressed the, the important institutes, the Rowett Institute and the James Hutton Institute uh, up in Aberdeen. Uh, and so it is quite clear there are good scientific uh, research going on right throughout uh, Scotland. Uh, and as, again, uh, Malcolm Chisholm, Alison uh, McInnes, Jenny Mara, Mark MacDonald said, while we congratulate the sector for its remarkable success and expansion, we should not forget that we do not retain enough of our female scientists. Uh, the Royal Society of Edinburgh report tapping on all talents was uh, produced by a working group chaired by a very eminent astrophysicist, Jocelyn Bell Burnell. And it quotes a statistic that 73% of women trained in STEM subjects uh, leave their profession as compared to 48% of men. So, men. so if we could just think about what even greater success Scottish science might have if you got the, the, the female participation up to the level of male participation in the longer term. And it is still the case that concerns such as childcare, attitudes towards people taking maternity leave, the difficulty in taking maternity leave when a researcher is on a fixed term contract, and problems with work life balance for women with caring responsibilities are still driving women out of science. And I personally find that very depressing because they were the, the factors that drove women out of science at the time I left, uh, and things don't seem to be getting that much better for women since. The Labour motion also mentions the possible takeover of AstraZeneca by Pfizer, and that doesn't seem to be uh, uh, reflected in the debate. And that's unfortunate, because although headquartered elsewhere in the United Kingdom, the possibility should be of concern to us, because AstraZeneca are major suppliers to the NHS. They work with health boards in Scotland, for example, Grampian, as Neil Baby said. Uh, and I do hope that the Scottish Government will support Ed Miliband's call for a public interest test and corporate deals, such as this potential takeover. In conclusion, it is good to celebrate the success of the life sciences. But many members have men mentioned issues of concern which do we need to, to address. Neil Bibby spoke of the levels of numeracy in schools. If you don't have the num numeracy skills, you're not going to be able to do science. Uh, Malcolm Chisholm and Jenny Mara talked about the uh, numbers, student numbers in uh, further ed education and life sciences decreasing. The Smith talked about the take-up of science subjects in schools and the Scottish Baccalaureate. Mary Scanlon mentioned the numbers of modern apprenticeships in life sciences. Uh, and I think there's a general concern about the curriculum for excellence as it comes in. Is, is it going to be sufficiently rigorous to prepare students to study sciences at university? Because actually, science is a rigorous discipline and they need to acquire those sorts of learning skills at school to be able to go on to succeed at university. And don't even get me started on uh, access to laboratories. I, I, agree with what Dennis Robertson uh, said in terms of the lab and the laboratory, but actually to do science, science is an experimental, so vocational subject, and young ch uh, children and young people need the opportunities to get out there and do experiments and learn from doing experiments, and unfortunately not enough that, of that goes on in our schools nowadays. Thank you. We now move to Alistair Alton to wind up the debate. Uh, Minister, five o'clock. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, this has, I believe, been a, a very positive debate in the main and has focused uh, on uh, life sciences as one of the many reasons that we can be proud of Scotland's academic and uh, economic uh, achievements. Life sciences are clearly uh, something in which Scotland excels. Many speakers have referred to that, and our contribution to global research uh, in this area is, is not only appropriate for us to celebrate, but also appropriate for us to think about what we can do to uh, exceed that in the future. There were many uh, very uh, uh, considered and uh, thoughtful contributions uh, in the debate. Uh, alas, that there was not a, 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 a contribution in this particular science de debate from Stuart Stevenson. I had been looking forward to that uh, following his uh, Van de Graaff generator speech, which uh, has entered into parliamentary folklore since the last science debate took place. Mr Bibby uh, made important points about uh, numeracy uh, in schools. Uh, I, I would say that there have been a number of measures uh, of, of numeracy in schools and we are far from complacent. The PISA statistics uh, did, ind did indicate that, that uh, good things are happening on that front. But I entirely appreciate the point that uh, is made about the need for uh, rigour and constant improvement, improvement in that area. Where I do take exception was where he more than once referred or used the phrase failing education system, and I take the greatest possible exception to that phrase being used uh, in the context of Scotland's schools. Um, Ms Smith uh, mentioned uh, a number of uh, areas around, also around uh, STEM subjects in schools, and also the, the work that we, we all acknowledge needs to be done to promote the, the baccalaureate, the science baccalaureate in schools too. Um, Ms Smith. 
The, the, the Scottish Baccalaureate was uh, presented as an added value because obviously it had that crucial mix of higher and advanced higher uh, and it's not being taken up. Could the Minister suggest reasons as to why that's not being taken up and what the Scottish Government is going to do to address that because it really is a key issue? Minister. Well, obviously, in the context of the new qualifications, uh, the baccalaureate is one of many options uh, for adding value to your qualifications. But as I've indicated, uh, that's uh, something that we, we constantly look at, constantly encourage, not only the baccalaureate for science, but obviously also the baccalaureate uh, for languages as well. Um, Mr Macdonald uh, mentioned many examples of, of international cooperation in the field of research, to which I could, of course, add the fact that the UK is, is in cooperation uh, very directly with uh, countries including Switzerland, Luxembourg, uh, the USA. I, I think I want to also um, mention uh, Mr Chisholm for a very thoughtful contribution about the research partnership that exists um, between uh, the research community and uh, Scotland's NHS. Uh, and, uh, I think uh, it's also worth saying that uh, in his own city, uh, Edinburgh College uh, is, uh, is also doing great work uh, around uh, the promotion of STEM subjects with a, a STEM academy uh, promoting links with schools too. Uh, I have to make some progress, but I'll come to you in a moment. Yeah. Uh, Aileen McLeod uh, spoke about uh, key uh, science sectors uh, and particularly something that was raised by other uh, speakers as well, an emerging science which is personalised medicine, which holds out some truly amazing opportunities uh, for uh, understanding and practising medicine in the future. And I give way. Minister, for giving way. Uh, was he as shocked as I was about the 21 modern apprenticeships in life sciences out of 25,000? And can he tell me how he plans to address that, given life sciences is one of the government's key sectors? Minister. Well, I would certainly argue for the importance of modern apprenticeships, which are, of course, far from the only uh, means of engaging uh, young people in science and science careers. But we constantly uh, advocate for, uh, uh, for the development of young people's skills. For instance, uh, at the other end of the, the equation, we also uh, are working to improve uh, people's lab skills, which was referred to earlier on, and people's employability uh, as scientists too. Um, there were a number of speakers, uh, I will try to get through some of them in the time available, but David Stewart rightly referred to some of Scotland's scientific achievements in the past, including Fleming, which I take to be a, a personal or an endorsement uh, of my personal practice of not cleaning my kitchen sink, uh, to a number of uh, speakers mentioned, in fact, including David Stewart, uh, mentioned the importance of the science sector to the Highlands and Islands. Uh, and, of course, the new campus in, in Inverness is relevant in that respect. Linda Fabiani reminded us of the importance of the application of life sciences, uh, not least in East Kilbride, uh, and was right to say that we need to be uh, ambitious uh, in that respect. Rod Campbell made an important point about the uh, fact that the future structure uh, of research uh, in Scotland will, to a very large degree, be in the hands of academics themselves and pointed to the the success of academic-driven uh, um, initiatives like research pools uh, and SALSA. Alison McInnes quite rightly mentioned the importance uh, to uh, Dundee of the life science sector. She mentioned that it relied on 60 nationalities, 60 countries, although I think that was immediately followed by an argument that the whole thing relied on one country. Um, but uh, I think a number of speakers, including Alice McInnes, uh, Mark MacDonald and Elaine Murray made a very important uh, argument indeed around ensuring uh, that we have uh, every encouragement and opportunity given to women uh, in science in Scotland. And I, I entirely uh, accept the argument we have to do much, much more in that respect. Although in the life sciences, it should be said, uh, we have something nearer the quality uh, in that respect than in other areas of science. And I, I must make some progress uh, now uh, in order to come to the conclusion of this debate. I think um, one thing that's uh, worth saying uh, as well uh, is that a number of speakers uh, mentioned that, uh, of course, research and science are not just about uh, traditional um, uh, categories of scientists. I must, I must make some progress, but about to close. I must make some progress. Uh, it's also about, for instance, the, the importance of technicians. I just want to, to conclude by saying something about the amendments. Uh, and uh, I think that it's uh, the reason that I'm happy to accept 
um, both amendments is because despite some of the arguments that were built upon uh, uh, the inoffensive text of the, the amendments, the amendments themselves uh, are positive. Uh, and I believe, for instance, that on Liz Smith's amendment, again, uh, I believe that uh, it's entirely reasonable uh, to, to point to uh, the successes of the, uh, the research uh, sector. Mr Bibby's amendment notes the important contribution of UK research councils, which uh, I'm happy again to uh, acknowledge, despite the fact we take, did we take different views about what the future should be. Uh, and he, he rightly mentions the issue about uh, uh, the takeover uh, or the proposed takeover uh, around uh, uh, Pfizer and uh, the fact that uh, it's worth mentioning in that context that uh, although neither company uh, has uh, a major base in Scotland, it is obviously a matter of interest. The uh, NHS in Scotland, to pick up on a point that was made around that, uh, has indicated uh, it has uh, no concerns about its future relationship with either company. But it is uh, entirely legitimate for the, the matter, uh, uh, as a matter of debate today, uh, for us to, to question whether the UK government intends to make any further inquiries about that. So in that spirit, uh, presiding officer, despite the fact that this uh, debate has uh, occasionally wandered into, uh, let's say, articles of faith, uh, and as a result the, uh, the debate has changed its character, that was predictable. But I think I want to begin, uh, or rather I want to end where I began and say that uh, uh, this sector, the life sciences sector, as well as providing uh, employment for 35,000 people in Scotland and 650 companies and constituting, as it does, one of the great successes of Scottish science, is at its heart something of which everyone in this parliament across all uh, partisan boundaries should be particularly proud uh, and it is particularly useful that we have chosen today to debate it. That concludes the debate on life sciences. Uh, we now move to the next item of business, which is consideration of parliamentary bureau motion number 9566 on committee memberships. So I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 9566 on committee memberships. Moved. The question on this motion will be put a decision to time to which we have come. There are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that amendment number 9963.2 in the name of Neil Bibby, which seeks to amend motion number 9963.2 in the name of Alistair Allen on life sciences be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is amendment number 9963.1 in the name of Liz Smith, which seeks to amend motion number 9963 in the name of Alistair Allen on life sciences be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 9963 in the name of Alistair Allen as amended twice on life sciences be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 9566 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on committee membership be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time and I now close this meeting.